This happened to me when I was 11, and staying at my friend Kit's house. Kit was one of those cool kids in school who was always up to trouble. Looking back, I don't understand how I managed to remain friends with him for so long, as I was anything but cool and never did anything he did. One night, I was staying over at his place one Friday after school, and we started playing touch football in the backyard one on one. After playing for about 20 minutes, he asked if I heard of a game called Mop, which I didn't. He explained to me the way the game works, is you hide by the road, and when someone walks or drives past, you shout the word Mop, hoping to get some kind of reaction. I suppose the game can be known by other names, but he called it Mop. I agreed, so we went down to his front yard and looked up and down the road to see if anyone was heading our way. I should note that Kit's house isn't actually on a main road, so the only reason you would drive down past on the left is if you had a house further down or had to turn down an intersection street for more houses. And about 20 houses past Kit's is a bush, so I wasn't expecting many people to pass by. I hid behind the garbage bins, which stand by the driveway fence, and Kit was hiding on the opposite side in the garden. At this point it was 4pm, so it was still light out, which to me made the game sound less fun. About two minutes in, a car drives by, and Kit shouts mop. Nothing happened, which was to no one's surprise. I knew someone driving by wouldn't even be able to hear us. Not long after, a man and woman were walking their dog, and as they were about to walk out of sight of Kit's house, he shouts mop. The man and the woman stopped and looked around confused for five seconds, and then began walking again. That was the exact reaction I was expecting. After about ten more disappointing reactions, I was starting to get bored, but Kit was just having too much fun. Eventually, I noticed a homeless man looking to make his way over. Kit hadn't seen him yet, so I gave him the signal that someone was near and he waited. As the man was getting closer, I could see that he was talking to himself like he was arguing with someone. As he got closer, I saw the man was at least in his 40s. I could see how dirty he looked, with long, greasy black hair, his face covered in dirt, and I was getting nervous. When the man was going past my sight, I heard Kit shout something I was not expecting. He shouts, Dickhead! The man looks right towards the house in an instant, looking absolutely furious. I was freaking out as the man could have easily spotted me hiding behind the bins. The man started passing back and forth with his eyes fixed on the house, muttering to himself. Eventually, he started walking back the way he was heading, and once he was out of view, I got out from behind the bins and made my way over to Kit. I was about to open my mouth to tell him how stupid that was when he said, let's follow him. I told him it was a terrible idea, but as a stupid 11-year-old kid, I agreed. We kept following at a distance and followed him off the road at the entrance of the bush. We hid behind a car and watched the man as he went in. I want to say that we left at that point, but Kit wanted to see where he was going, so we followed. Kit went in first, and I followed close behind. I was walking as quietly as possible, but the leaves were all so dry they crunched very loudly. About five minutes in of following, Kit stopped dead in his tracks, and I heard him mutter, Oh crap. I walked up to him. And just behind some rocks was the man crouched down looking at us. I didn't have time to react, as the man stood up and sprinted towards us, shouting like a madman. Kit and I turned and began screaming. I could just sense the man's presence closing in on me, and I was fearing that at any second he would grab me, and that would be the end of me. Luckily for me, the man tripped and fell. I remember just feeling the air move under the man's body inches behind me. I was easily within an arm's reach. Hearing the man fall, I slowed down, looked back, and saw him lying flat on his stomach, and he let out an angry growl. I turned and continued running. I couldn't see Kit at this point, but I could hear the crunching of leaves and branches, and I knew he was close. 
Eventually I got out of the bush and started running on the road back to the house. When I got there, Kit was already there out of breath and sweating. I started crying due to the fear that something terrible may have happened, and I never spoke of this story to anyone. Apparently neither did Kit. I didn't go to his house after that, and my deepest apologies to the man who my friend and I mistreated. I was a pretty difficult teenage girl for my parents to manage. Around the age of 15, I was at the peak of this behavior. I was drinking with my friends every weekend, sneaking out of the house in the middle of the night, exploring the world of boys, and just getting up to no good. My grandma passed away when I was young, around the age of nine. She was my only grandparent, and we shared a really special bond. She had dozens of grandchildren, but openly favored me. She was eventually diagnosed with dementia, and towards the end, she would call everyone by my name, even her own children. One night, when I was 16, I snuck out of the house to visit my boyfriend. This wasn't an unusual occurrence. I did this pretty regularly and had it down to a fine art. However, the only difference this time was that I needed to walk a few streets over and get a taxi because he wasn't able to pick me up. I stuffed some pillows under the quilt, put my hair extensions at the top to make it look like I was still in bed if my parents ever checked on me. Then I opened the window and started walking to where I planned for a cab to meet me. It was always an anxiety inducing experience, but for some reason I was feeling really off about that night. I soldiered on. I'd only walked a few streets away from my house when I saw my mum was calling me. I panicked and started sprinting home apologizing profusely to my mum on the phone as I was running. When I got back to the house, my mum was waiting outside. She was so shaken and was crying a lot. I felt so horrible. She said she had a dream that my grandma, her mother, walked into her room and prompted her to wake up and check on me. Mum said she jolted awake and went straight to my bedroom to find my pillows and extensions and the window slightly ajar. This experience really pulled me in line and my relationship with my parents is wonderful now. It always had stuck with me and my mum. I often wonder what might have happened if mum hadn't have had that dream. I imagine things would have been very different. This happened to me Around a year and a half ago, my boyfriend at the time and I were sitting in the living room of my apartment when I heard a knock at the door. My ex asked if I was expecting anyone, and I said no. But I could just take a look in case to see who was out there. He stayed on the couch while I looked through the people. The apartment was set up in a way that didn't allow him to see me from the living room to the front room. Outside, there were two people, one young African-American man, looked about mid-twenties, and a much older Asian woman who looked to be in her sixties. For whatever reason, I decided to open the door. When I opened it, the young man says, Hi, we are a part of so-and-so religion, and we would like to talk to you about it. I have a 50 pound dog who's trying to get out. So I said, sure, hold on. I'll come outside because my dog's trying to get out. This was a huge mistake. I want to clarify that this was very out of character for me. However, I had recently become closer to God and just wanted to give these people a chance as I didn't believe any harm would come by just listening to what they had to say. I was stepping outside and closing the door behind me and was about to listen to what they had to say. They said something about how they pray to Mary instead of God because she was the one who birthed Jesus. I don't exactly remember what, but it was something like that. I thanked them for their time and then say something like, 
Thanks, guys. Stay safe out there. And thought I'd leave it at that. The Asian woman visibly starts panicking and saying things I don't understand in another language. When I look to her partner to see what he has to say about her behavior, he says, no problem. Perhaps you want a pamphlet though. Uh, sure. Not wanting to be rude and also to do some research on the religion as I'd never heard of it before. The guy then says, okay, great. We have them in the car. You can come with us. We're parked right out front. At that moment, I start feeling weird. I lived on the third story of an apartment complex that really was not the best place and there were no cameras anywhere. Why would they just leave their pamphlets in the car if they were going to door to door? It wouldn't make much sense to have each person they intrigued come down to the car. And the parking spots outside my house were almost all handicapped and no one can park there. The woman grabbed my arm and started directing me to the stairs. In a split second, I say, you know what, I'm a Christian and I'm very happy with my faith, but thank you anyway. The woman again said something in a language I couldn't understand and the man goes, are you sure we can get it to you really fast? We're parked right there. My heart genuinely sank into my butt. I started sweating and looking for ways to remove myself from her grasp and the situation entirely. I know I must have looked panicked and I was. What do I do? How do I get away from the immediate danger I just put myself in? I wasn't thinking and just blurted out that I was very sure, yanked my hand from the woman who ended up scratching me from her grasp and bolted inside. I locked the door behind me and told my boyfriend what happened. That's when he looks at me and he made a face that I've never seen him make before. He tells me about how that specific religion has been in the news for the last few weeks because women have been going missing. And the only thing they have in common is some of the neighbors saying they had been solicited by the group the same day or around the day or time the neighbor disappeared. I read some articles to fact check what he was saying and he was right. The police were saying that it might be in connection with a trafficking ring that was moving from neighboring cities and now was suspected to be in ours. It gets weirder somehow though. I seriously freaked out, went straight to Facebook Live and shared with my friends because I wanted to warn whoever it was that I could. I set the privacy to public after the live ended and went on with my life still a bit shaken. One week later, I get a Facebook message from someone who is, I'm assuming, part of that religious group, telling me I need to take the post down and she was not nice about it. After I said I wouldn't because I wanted to educate anyone who lives in my town, she told me I was a spoiled egg and I would regret making that video. I was afraid and blocked her immediately, set the video to private and called the police. The police said they couldn't do much as I didn't have the make or model of the car they were in and there was no proof that they had even come to my apartment or who it was. But here's the part that still freaks me out. When I went to show them the messages from Facebook, I went to unblock the lady. Her page was completely deleted. I still had the messages, but it was like talking to a little gray default profile picture. Even the name had changed to something that seemed to be the random strokes of a keyboard. I want to end this by letting you all know that I am no longer being as trustworthy as I was before. I know the things I should have done differently now and get upset with myself as to how I acted. I'm afraid that they really are a trafficking ring. And so to all those people involved, please let's never meet again. My name is Courtney. And in 2006, my boyfriend Tommy went to jail and I was left alone in one of the lowest times of my life. I say that because at the time we were both addicted to drugs. I'm almost two years clean today, but at the time we were pretty deep in our addiction. And luckily before Tommy got arrested, we were renting a room in our friend Christina's grandmother's house. They lived in a town called Tierra Santa which is a suburban small town in San Diego, California, where Tommy and Christina both grew up. It wasn't just Christina and her grandmother living there though. It was also Christina's brother, Michael, her cousin, Nicole, and her brother's friend, Samuel. 
It was a very big house. It had four bedrooms in a garage that was converted into two more bedrooms. We were staying in one of the garage rooms, or I guess at this point, only I was staying there. At the time, me, Christina and Nicole were all using drugs. And with that lifestyle, usually you have a lot of traffic. Plus, there were three other people living there and everyone besides her grandmother smoked pot. So there were always people coming in and out of the house at any given time, day or night. So I was very used to hearing doors open and close all night without even giving it a second thought. Ever since my boyfriend had been incarcerated, we mostly communicated through letters, but we also spoke over the phone. We didn't get long, mostly just relay important things and tell each other how much we missed one another really quickly. Phone calls in jails are pretty expensive and we had no real income at the time besides hustling just enough drugs to support our habits, which I came to find was a lot harder to do alone. Anyway, I remember one phone call he had briefly, mentioning that he knew a guy from Tierra Santa named Brett who was in jail with him. It wasn't anything significant. We weren't friends with the guy. In fact, we had an altercation with him the only time I'd actually met him. So I really wasn't fond of him, but it was a pretty big coincidence that he had ended up in the same unit as Tommy. Tommy said Brett apologized to him about the incident we had and they were sort of getting along now. I didn't blame him because Tommy didn't know too many other people in jail and I'm sure it was nice to have someone he was familiar with there even if the guy was a complete piece of... Anyway, about a month after that one, one afternoon, Christina's sister Nicole came home with a guy who I didn't recognize. At the time, she honestly did this a lot, so I wasn't really surprised, but then I noticed that the guy looked familiar. It was Brett. Brett was always in and out of jail. He would serve a month at a time for small paraphernalia charges or whatever, then he'd be out again into his next jail visit. We didn't say much to each other, basically just hi and bye. Then he went upstairs with Nicole and I went back up to my room and that was that. Now I don't know if I had mentioned seeing Brett to Tommy or not, because honestly it was hard for Tommy to hear about guys coming over to the house. He wasn't necessarily jealous, but it's hard not to be a little when you're in that position. We have had arguments about it before, and I didn't like to make him stress out more than he already was or ruin the little time that we had to talk. So I tried to avoid bringing that stuff back up. But looking back on it now, I wish I had said something to him because he may have prepared me for what was coming. It was about a week later, early morning, and I could hear Nicole, Christina and their grandmother getting in the car and driving off, as well as our other roommate, Samuel. So basically I was alone in the house, which was rare. So I figured I would take advantage of the house being empty to get up and do some much needed cleaning and cook some breakfast. So I was in the middle of doing the dishes when I heard it, a voice coming from behind me. Hey Courtney. Scared and confused, I turn around to see Brett. I stole some steaks. Do you want to eat? He asked. I looked confused. What are you doing here? Tom showed me your pictures in jail. You look really good, he said with a creepy smile on his face. At this point, I could smell the alcohol on him. I noticed that he was holding a backpack. I just said, please get out of here. I have things to do. I'm really busy. Want a drink? No, just leave. I could hear it in his voice. He was wasted, probably hadn't slept in days. He reached into his backpack and pulled out the bottle. And the next thing he said was, you know, I'm loaded. It's in the backpack. That's when I knew this was serious. Okay, well, it's way too early to drink and I'm so tired and Tom wouldn't be okay with you being here. He said, Tom won't care. Just make me dinner. He was wasted. All I could think about was the firearm and how I was going to get out of this situation. I was looking for anything I could grab, any options. That's when he began walking towards me. So I started walking the opposite way around the kitchen table that was between us, pretending to clean and telling him, seriously, you need to go. That's when he grabbed me and held me down on the table and he slapped me. He said, what's wrong with you? Not gonna touch you. 
So at first I thought those were probably his intentions, but now I knew they were. Inside I was freaking out, but was trying to play it cool, because this was serious, and I was truly scared for my life. He let go of me and started talking about making dinner again, and how pretty I was. I don't recall it all because I was just thinking about what I was going to do. Then in the corner of my eye, I saw him with the bottle in his hand, cocking it back as if he were going to hit me with it. That's when I got an idea. I needed to play along with him right now. Oh my God, I need a cigarette, I said, and sped away from him. Do you want to come smoke with me? And after that, I'll make you your steak. He liked that idea. So I walked outside and lit a cig. The side yard is small. It's just a walkway with a sidewalk and some bricks in front of some plants. So when I saw he was outside, I quickly turned around and squeezed by him, went into the house and locked the door behind me. He was furious. He was yelling to let him back in and started banging on the door. I immediately ran to the front door and locked it as well and then called the police. I ran back to the side door and showed him that I was on the phone and he was banging on the door until we realized what I was doing and then he ran out the side gate. Okay, so side note. This house has had a lot of police calls because like I said, there have been a lot of drug addicts coming in and out and we were always getting complaints from neighbors. So believe it or not, even after calling the cops and telling them the guy attacked me and was outside my house banging on the door, they didn't show up for six hours. So at that point, we didn't even answer the door. It doesn't end there. A few weeks later, about 9 p.m. at night, I'm sleeping in my room and get woken up by the sound of the door opening. You guessed it, it was Brett. He had come back. This time, the house was not empty, so I just screamed, get the hell out my house, and he instantly ran out my room and out the front door. I called the police again, and this time they showed up after only a few hours. When I gave the statement, one of the cops knew Brett very well and told me that on the same day I originally called, they got another call from a few houses down and found Brett passed out from alcohol poisoning on their front lawn. They didn't have a reason to why they didn't show up that day, but they basically made me feel like it was all my fault for not locking the front door that I didn't know was unlocked. Bottom line is they really don't care, I'm sure because they knew there was drug activity in the house and they were very judgmental. So we got no justice from the police. Next month though, I made sure the doors were locked every night and still didn't sleep well. It was about three months after the original incident that I get a call from Tommy with some interesting news. Guess who he ran into in jail? Now I don't want to give too many details about what happened, but basically after the incident at the house, Tommy told everyone in his pod about it, so they all knew what Brett had done and were waiting for him. So as soon as he landed in the same unit again, everyone got Tommy and basically handed him to Brett on a silver platter. I can't go into too much detail, but I can say that from that night on, Brett spent the rest of his time in jail in the medical unit. And unlike the police in the street, the deputies in jail understood the situation and basically gave Tommy a slap on the wrist. The deputies even said that they would have done the same thing in his shoes. They even helped convince Brett not to press charges on Tommy by saying he could get in more trouble for what he did to me, if only he knew how little the actual police cared. Since that day, Brett has never tried to contact me or Tommy again. It's been about three and a half years since this happened and apparently Brett doesn't even use social media anymore or talk or show his face to anyone in Tierra Santa anymore. And thank God for that. Let's never meet again. I have only told this story to three people outside the old military buddies who have similar stories to this experience. First, I need to set the scene. Tucked in a mountain valley, in Balgan, Afghanistan, is a place called Russian Hill. Tapa Gurgan, as it's also known. We just call it Tapa. It's the only hill in this entire valley, and that is not by mistake. It is a burial mound that has existed since the times of Alexander the Great. Generations of locals have been buried here, and this also includes the dead Russians from the failed invasion back in the 80s. Now, 
What did the American Special Operations do when they came to this valley? That's right. Level off the top and stick a combat outpost on it. So this is where my story begins. I was a regular army paratrooper attached to the special operations team that built the outpost. One of the roles of the regular army guys was to watch the radios at night. We would always get weird babble on them at night, but that could be written off as interface. Though years as a radio operator for my team led me to think otherwise. I had that duty one night. Between 2.45 and 3 a.m., my shift ends, and I walk down the hill to our little bathroom area. I'm doing my business in this little cinder block hut with a hole in it when I hear walking up the hill next to me. I at first think nothing of it, probably just one of the local guards coming up for a shift change. But being in the middle of the night and me in a combat zone, I do listen and pay attention. I can hear the sound of gear rattling, which I know for a fact that our locals don't wear gear with meta inch buckles or boots for that matter. I've been on patrol with them multiple times and they hang around the outpost and I know what they sound like when they move. This wasn't that. This was the heavy set boot steps of a soldier in combat gear. Now not wanting to die on the throne and the fact that I was one of very few Americans at this outpost, I decided I probably needed to know who was going up the hill. So I crack the door and peek outside and holy hell bananas, there is someone on the hill. It happened to be a mostly full moon and I had decent ambient light. They were carrying an AK, so not an American. They also had on a uniform that's not the typical Afghan garb, not one of our ALPs. At this point, they are close to the top of the hill and this person is not someone from the outpost. I grab my rifle and pop out the door and run up the hill after them. I get to the top. Not a single person was around. I walk over to the building where the radio guard is and knock on the door. My buddy answers and asks what's up. I checked them to see if anyone else was up or came in there and he said that no one had come out of the barracks. I bummed a cigarette and laughed about what happened. The next day while eating lunch, we joked about it and one of the special ops guys who had been there longer told us it was the resident Russian ghost. Claimed he started appearing after they used dirt from the hills to fill our HESCO basket for the wall. Turns out they found some bones while doing it. He even told us he had been face to face with it and even drew his sidearm. All the other guys kind of chimed in about their own creepy stories about the place. I got moved to another outpost a few weeks later. Always got super creepy feelings whenever we would visit there. I have experienced sleep paralysis twice in my life so far. I'm turning 22 this year. My first experience happened during the summer of 2015 was downright terrifying. It was before my senior year in high school. I had been watching horror stories on YouTube, which at the time was a very cool and popular thing. I came across a video by horror narrator Lazy Masquerade. Eight true terrifying sleep paralysis stories. I thought to myself, sleep paralysis, what's that? I enjoyed the video and binged watch more horror stories after that. But I really like these videos and still do to this day. Less than a week later, I experienced it. I awoke at 4.30 in the morning. I was laying on my back and when I went to move, I realized I could not. All I could do was move my eyes. That's when I see a dark figure, tall. It looked like a man wearing a hoodie. Roughly six foot four, 250 pound man. I know that sounds cliche, but I couldn't see his face. He was looking down at me and this experience probably lasted about two minutes. While I was laying there, 
All I was thinking of was this man could end my life at any moment. That's pretty much all I remember from that first experience. Kind of ironic how shortly after watching a video of sleep paralysis, it happened to me. That was almost five years ago, and I recently had another experience. I had woken up a lot earlier than usual because my older sister was visiting us and had my niece and nephew over. It was 9 a.m. I visited for a little bit and caught up with family that doesn't live with us. My parents took them and my younger sister out for lunch. I didn't go because we wouldn't be back in time for me to get ready for work. So I decided to go back to sleep for two more hours, then go get ready. I woke up and thought I heard footsteps and a girl laughing. It wasn't my mom or any of my sisters and I don't have a girlfriend. It didn't sound like the laugh from a girl I knew. I was laying on my back with my head turned facing the wall next to my bed, but also facing my window and my futon. I could see my cat sitting on my futon, staring at the corner of the room where my door was, and I realized I couldn't move. I tried. I was completely frozen. I could only move my eyes. I only heard the laugh three times, the footsteps twice, and it was all coming from the hall. My cat was staring intently at the corner. I couldn't face it. I swear I felt as if someone was in the room, which didn't make sense because even if someone was in our house, my cat would hide. She really doesn't like new people. This experience only lasted about two minutes. Next thing I remember, I could get up and get ready for work. I told my coworkers about it and we kind of just laughed and joked about it. My supervisor even told me a story that had happened to one of his friends supposedly talking to Satan during a sleep paralysis experience. I told my family later that night when I got home. So yes, those are my two stories. It's weird how your mind can play scary tricks on you like that sometimes. I used to drive for Papa John's and I have several stories I wish to share. One day I ended up with this delivery on the evening shift and it was after the dinner rush as far as I can recall. So things were quieter and not as many people were out and about or on the roads. The customer lived kind of deep in this rundown neighborhood full of single story houses. And when I arrived, literally every single light in the house was off. I walked up to the door, figuring that I might as well ring the doorbell since they ordered it. After all, they were waiting for me, right? So I ring, nothing. I waited a bit, ring again, but there was nothing. At this point I figure they aren't there or perhaps they're asleep. So I walk away from the door and was about to call my boss to relay that I might have to bring the pizza back. When almost silently, a front door opens up. It's so dark inside, it's like a scene from a horror movie where you can't see anything at all. Two pale, stringy looking people come out the darkness without saying much at all, paying cash for the pizza and then take it and quietly retreat back into the darkness without ever turning on the lights. I left pretty quickly as it freaked me out. Was I in danger? I doubt it. But those guys were pretty creepy. On another occasion, I had to deliver to this really terribly run down extended stay motel that I always hated going to because it was literally the most dangerous place we delivered to. It was very late, around 10 p.m. or midnight. I get out of my car, got the pizza from the trunk, and as I begin walking across the parking lot to the guy's room, I see that down at the far end of the parking lot are a very large crowd of people. From what I could tell, they looked like a gang or just a lot of rough people hanging around. I became nervous. After I gave the guy his pizza, I took my empty pizza bags and was walking back when I looked left and they were all walking towards my direction. Keep in mind, this is a crowd of 30 plus people and not a single one of them were walking anywhere else. I very quickly cranked the car 
and got out of there before I had a chance to figure out what was going on, or if it was me they were coming for specifically. Finally, I delivered to this old guy in this same rundown neighborhood as the first story. I had been to his house before, and his deranged looking son was the one who usually answered the door, but this time I got pops, and I'll never forget it. He opened the door shirtless, and I was immediately greeted with what looked like a surgical scar. Not too bad, right? It was infested with what looked like warts or skin growth. I don't mean a few either. It was absolutely covered in them. To such a point where I can't think about it without getting sick. They were pale looking, but the color of rotted snot. It reminded me of the way sea life latches onto other creatures and grows. It was pretty scarring. He paid in cash, and I left as quickly as I could. I remember immediately hitting the hand sanitizer in my car, and practically bathing in it. Other than those, I've had a few weirdos, but nothing seriously creepy. There was a guy we delivered to whose nickname was Captain Underpants because he always answered the door in his undies. Gross, but nothing that would mess you up. We also had this massive, sprawling apartment complex that we often had to deliver to, and all the drivers hated it. It had multiple apartment buildings with the same numbers, so it was awful to navigate through, but otherwise new and rather nice. One day I got this delivery to a guy way in the back of the complex called Mr. White. I make my way back there, and as I climb up the stairs I hear this muffled sound coming from his room. I knock, and Mr. White opens the door looking like Mr. Rogers. He had a sweater and everything, but as he's paying for the pizza I keep hearing muffled gags, sounding like female screams coming from his apartment and it did not sound like the TV. It sounded like a person. But the guy just kept on smiling as he paid, acting like nothing was wrong, and not even trying to explain it away as the TV or anything. He was chill as ice. He finished paying, took the pizza, and I walked back down, kind of wigging out over what i just heard. I couldn't be sure it was someone, but I hated to do nothing, and someone die because of it. I called my boss on the way back, and he advised me to call the police immediately. So I did. They took my name, but I never heard anything about what happened or if the guy was actually doing anything to someone in there. But regardless, it freaked me out. Either I called the cops on an innocent customer, or I saved someone from a psychopath. I still think about that night, from time to time. My wife swore the house we lived in about 10 years ago was haunted, because she's a nurse and she works three 12 hour days per week. That left her alone in the house at least twice a week. I worked, the kids had school, and she claimed she heard doors open and close and saw things from the corner of her eye, but never really saw anything. I'm a skeptic. The house was built in 79 and is in an established subdivision. I explained it may be noises from the outside she's hearing. She had a lot of family pictures hung down below the hallway. If the bathroom door was open, the light from the window shined down the hall. The sunlight would often filter through an oak tree and make the light dance off the glass in the picture frames. The illusion of movement catches your eye, but there's nothing there. She disagreed and stood by her claim. She never felt malice or was scared, she just said that there was something there. I'm a skeptic. She isn't. We agree to disagree. One Saturday morning, we're in the master bedroom on our computers. Just her and me, and our beagle. Arkley was asleep on our bed. Our son had called earlier and said he was coming over any minute. I hear the door open and Barkley jumps up and goes to open the bedroom door, looks down the hall and barks. I heard the door close. It wasn't just the sound of the door. It was also the sound a house makes when an outside door opens and the pressure changes in it. I called out that we were in the back. Barkley jumped back up on the bed and resumed his nap. A few minutes went by and both my wife and I 
focused on finishing up emails or whatever. Then I realized our son was still in the front of the house. I called out and got no response. So I went down the hall to find him. He wasn't there. I checked the front door and the deadbolt was locked. The garage door was locked, as well as the patio door. While I was scratching my head, our son drove up. I asked him if he had just gotten to the house. I heard it. She heard it. The dog heard it. But there was no way any of those doors were opened. And nobody opened a door to leave. I've got nothing. Well, unless you count my wife telling me, I told you so. Then I got plenty. But I can't explain what happened at all. And that was my only experience. But my wife complained all the time. Nothing mean, spirited or evil. Just odd. I just graduated from boot camp. While I was there, some strange things happened to me and some other recruits that we could not explain. And I've come in search of answers. When you are in boot camp, you have to stand watch occasionally for a few hours. I was usually put on watch at night. Me and my partner usually stood watch from midnight to around 2 a.m. My job was usually roving security, which is basically the person who patrols a set area and takes temperature readings and looks for suspicious activity. Usually the most serious thing I deal with were other recruits messing around in the bathrooms and telling them to go back to their bunks. One night at around two in the morning, I was making my rounds and thought I heard talking coming from the bathroom. I went inside and heard whispering coming from the showers, so I walked towards them and what I saw was just weird. I saw a young man, around 17 to 20, hunched over facing away from me in the darkest corner of the shower area. I walked towards him and said, Hey man, I need you to get back to your bunk. And as I was approaching him, I swear he vanished into thin air in the blink of an eye. I remember the feeling of pure shock and confusion. When I walked out, the other guy on watch asked me why I was so pale. And I told him what happened. I told him exactly what I had seen, and he said it was most likely a result of me being tired from all the stress of boot camp and lack of sleep. I agreed with him because I figured why would a ghost haunt a shower at boot camp of all places? And I was pretty tired that night. The next day I did not have watch, but the recruit who had my usual shift reported seeing a shadow in the showers and some weird whispering noises while there, despite the fact there was no one. I talked to him and told him what I had seen and that it was most likely our minds playing tricks on us because we were all tired. He agreed and decided we should just ignore it. That was until I started seeing things outside the showers. I had a slightly earlier watch that night and I was patrolling the bunks checking on recruits who were sick as I was supposed to. I was walking past some empty bunks and saw some movement from the corner of my eye. I figured it was some recruits messing with me, so I go to tell them to go back to bed. But as I approach the empty bunks, I see some kind of shadowy figure that did not look humanoid to me. It was like a dark blob moving around. When I investigated, it vanished. The area it was in was extremely cold compared to the rest of the room. I just walked away as there was nothing to do there and figured that the staff must have cranked the air conditioning. And I was just, tired, making stuff up. I saw this out of the corner of my eye all throughout boot camp while on the early morning watch. The last story for me was from when I was being tasked with taking temperatures throughout the whole building. My job was to go to each division's compartment and ask for their room temperature. I had just taken all but two other division's temperatures and was looking for the last two. As I walked past some empty rooms, I could have sworn I saw movement inside, so I figured maybe I missed a room and went to look inside their window. The room was just being used as storage and was pitch black except for the light from outside. All I could see were some boxes and empty bunks, but out of the corner of my eye, I saw a person standing in the edge of the light facing me. I saw this and decided I was just going to look elsewhere for the last two rooms, which I found a few minutes later. 
However, as I was returning, I turn, and in my readings I notice in the hallway a shadowy arm or limb being outstretched and coming back behind a doorway. And when I passed, there was nothing. But the area it was in was super cold, and that room was just a closed janitorial closet. The other recruit I previously mentioned spoke about seeing someone dancing in the showers at night, but there being nothing when he investigated. He also said that one night he passed by the showers and saw someone peek out and disappear behind the wall, and there was no one there when he investigated, but he noted the area was really cold. I know I'm gonna get called a liar, an attention seeker, but I know these are all true. I'm not here to try and fabricate stories or anything like that. I don't wanna get into trouble, so I can't disclose where this all happened, but it was very, very spooky. I am a 20 year old male and was born and raised in central London. I am very familiar with the potential dangers in central London and I'm usually a very cautious person and tend not to find myself in sketchy situations. On this day, however, I knew I had no one to blame but myself for having allowed myself and the love of my life to be in a scenario of potential danger. Having grown up in central, you quickly learn which areas to avoid as you do in a very big city. And being as cautious as I usually am, I knew better than to have been where I was at that time of day. Me and my current girlfriend Mia had been hanging out early on in our relationship. And one thing we loved to do was meet up after work and seeing as it was summer and the sun was still out until quite late in the evening, we would hang out in one of London's biggest parks, Hyde Park. We would usually stay in the more populated areas of the park and would sometimes have a drink while we enjoyed the sunset together, sitting on the grass or by the lake. On this evening, we were doing exactly that, just sitting on the grass, and we had a small bottle of vodka that we were sharing between us. We felt like having a drink, seeing as we had had a stressful week at work and were just chilling. For some reason though, this evening had a strange vibe to it. I remember me and my girlfriend talking about her grandmother, who she told me believed in tarot card readings and had done a reading for her before she left her country to move to London. And during the reading, her grandmother had told her something along the lines of, in London, you will find happiness and it's somewhere you need to be. But that also something really bad was to happen to her while she was here. And for some reason, this put me on edge, seeing as we were still in the early stages of our relationship and not to say I generally believe in any of those things, but I'm not necessarily a non-believer either. The sun was starting to go down, and it got to a point where we were both sort of buzzed from the vodka, and at this point I guess we were both feeling some tension, and both of us had the same look in our eyes, as if to say, let's find somewhere quiet to be alone. And this was when in retrospect, the cautious side of me should have been the dominant force, and told me to quit it wrong time and place. But no, instead, both of us were thinking differently. Now I know parks at night in London are known to be the safest places with the odd crackheads here and there. And usually the sketchy stuff goes down in the middle of the night. So I never really hung out in parks until late. As we both decided to look for somewhere quiet to chill in private, we walked deeper into Hyde Park towards a more sort of forested area with a huge mansion style building and a dimly lit path for cyclists and pedestrians. There were a bunch of trees over to the side in pitch darkness where we thought, okay, this looks fine. And there's a big building a hundred meters that's fairly lit, albeit no one to be seen. So it seems secluded enough for possibly to hang out in peace, but not so secluded that anything sketchy will go down. As we stepped off the path into the trees, we walked deeper into the trees and Mia pulled on my arm. Babe, I saw something move over there. Then she pointed to some trees and bushes about 20 meters away. I think I saw someone walking. This is when I was being as cautious as I usually am. And I should have said no and made a U-turn and left, but no, I told her to wait. Got the flashlight from my phone out and walked over to where she said she'd seen someone. I walked around and didn't see anyone or anything, 
So I walked back over to her and we agreed it was probably shadows from the trees playing tricks on her imagination. After checking a couple of trees with low hanging branches, we found one we thought we could sit under and the branches were hanging really low, right down to the ground. And it created a sort of perimeter around us where anyone walking down the lit path would be unable to see us. We could see out of the foliage and branches and could see lights from the main road faintly on the opposite side of the park. As we were really deep, in the less populated side of the park at this point. All in all, once we had arrived, I'm pretty sure she and I were both no longer feeling as romantic as we were before, and we felt quite on edge. We're sitting down against a tree trunk, with her on my lap. We were making out, and I felt we were really relaxed at this point and the shadows that we had seen before were slowly slipping back into the recesses of our minds. We were sharing a kiss when a strange feeling compelled me to open my eyes, and as I did I noticed the silhouette of what in that split second my brain associated to be two thick branches from the low hanging branches, but they caught my attention as my brain began to process that they were not what I thought they were. They were in fact a pair of legs. As I followed those pair of legs, I saw the silhouette of a hooded man standing there, not moving a muscle. And even though it was pitch black, I was sure I could feel this man's gaze. He was staring directly at us. My heart skipped a beat. Somehow I managed to just keep calm enough to whisper in her ear, Babe, there's someone watching us. Get up. I don't think she really understood me but understood enough to turn around to see what I was talking about. And at that point she screams, but the man doesn't move and doesn't flinch. He doesn't react, and it's probably the most frightening part of this encounter. Normally when someone's up to no good, upon being caught they would react in some way, whether in panic or run. But instead, nothing. He stood there staring at us without a word. Just as she screamed, I told her to get up. And so did I, and I moved in front of her almost waiting for some sort of reaction from the man, or expecting someone else to jump out from somewhere. I'm waiting to see what his move is so that I can react. I was split between confronting him, making a run for it, or waiting for him to make his move. In those 10 seconds of indecision, he slowly turns to his left and begins walking away, seemingly unbothered, and this was the moment I saw fit to get Mia and myself from out under the tree onto the lit path, while doing so not taking my eyes off what I could still see of the man through the trees. I could see his legs walking until he seemingly just vanished. Once we reached the path, my first thought was to grab the bottle of vodka we had from earlier, knowing we had to follow the path towards the exit from the park, or at least to a more populated section of it the direction of the path also being the direction the creepy man had seemed to walk in. Hence, me holding onto the glass bottle of vodka, thinking that if things go from bad to worse, at least I can attempt to use it as some sort of protection. We follow the path, me holding me tightly. My awareness levels have now shot through the moon, head on a swivel. Having followed the path for what felt like an eternity, we finally reached civilization and left the path. Every now and then I still get flashbacks of the image of the silhouette of the man just standing there staring. I've thought about what his intentions could have been, and many things come to mind. But one thing that I am certain of, are that his intentions were far from good. Since then, neither of us have returned to any park at night nor have we gone to secluded areas of any park for any reason. A lesson learned, that could have been easily avoided. Seeing as I wasn't oblivious to potential threats and dangers in parks at night, I've always known better, and I deeply regret having allowed myself to be put in a position, along with someone I deeply care about, where she or I could have been harmed. I appreciate this story may be a little anticlimactic, and isn't as scary to many of you listeners as it was for us, but it certainly scared the hell out of us. And to this day, the image of the motionless silhouette standing there staring at us in the dark has not left my mind.
Two months ago, my out-of-state cousin Nick and I met up in California for a music festival. Nick introduced me to a woman from his hometown, Monica. Monica was selling LSD, and I was curious, but I didn't know the first thing about buying stuff. So I got in touch with my friend Sasha, who lives a few states east and is more street smart. Sasha gave me good advice about best practices. She told me to ask about dosage. So when I turned to Monica, I asked about it. Monica told me she wasn't sure of the dosage. Actually, it was one drop on a sugar cube. I asked if maybe I should just eat half the cube to be safe, and she said it would be hard to tell where the drop landed, and she didn't know. So I shrugged, traded her for a pack of cheap beer, dropped acid and saw some bands, went home, and returned to my normal life. On December 16th at 5am, I'm having an emotionally vivid dream, where I had the following dialogue. Sasha died today. What? How? She wasn't sick, she... She overdosed. That doesn't make sense. Sasha knows her doses, that doesn't make sense. I have to talk to Monica. As in, Sasha's older sister, Monica. Oh god, no. And then I woke up abruptly and very upset. I couldn't shake the feeling until I eventually told Sasha about it midday. That same evening, Nick messaged me to let me know that Monica had passed away. She passed in a traffic accident at 10am that morning about five hours after I had the dream. I found out because there was a news article about it. I mean, this is weird, right? Has this ever happened to anyone? I'm a 22 year old female and used to do DoorDash on the side for some extra cash. This was in the summer of 2018 when it was a little bit newer, at least in my town. Since then, I think they've made a lot of changes, but at the time it was a little unorganized. If you don't know what DoorDash is, it's like a food delivery service, typically for restaurants that don't deliver. Think McDonald's. Anyway, the one night I was doing deliveries all day, I decided to do my last delivery at around 10. So I get an order in and the person wants a medium sized cheese and pepperoni pizza and loaded potato wedges from a pizzeria nearby. I was kind of wondering why they'd ordered from a pizzeria that delivers, but I figured it's because the place was notorious for taking forever when you order for delivery. I accepted the order and headed to said pizzeria. I got there and picked up the pizza, confirmed on the app that I had picked everything up, and was on my way. The app notified me of the special instructions on the customer's form, which asked for me to call them when I was outside. Okay then, nothing unusual there. Lots of people ask that so that they can come out to get it from me. I get to their address, and it's in downtown. It's a larger apartment building, and it's completely pitch black. I instantly get an eerie feeling. So I pull to the curb, stay in the car. Hell no was I about to go near that building and call the number. Luckily DoorDash has this thing that hides your actual phone number. It rings a few times and then this creepy woman's voice comes on the line and says, we can't get to the phone right now. We're a little tied up and then creepily giggles. Meanwhile, the entire time in the background, there's another woman screaming. And I mean screaming for help and for her life. It even got louder, as if the creepy woman was purposefully putting the screaming woman on the phone. I instantly hung up and drove off really quick, not even acknowledging which direction to go to. Luckily, there was a super popular restaurant a few blocks away and I pulled into that parking lot and pulled up the app. I was worried about getting in trouble for not being able to deliver the order, so I contacted DoorDash Help Center and they told me I had to wait 15 minutes to see if they'd called me or messaged me about their food. 
well, they never did. I'm sitting there in the parking lot of the restaurant telling my mum about it, and we agree it's probably just a prank, and just in case it isn't, I should call the police. So I call the non-emergency number and tell them anything. The police tell me they're going to do a wellness check and actually thanked me for calling them to tell them about it. I went home and nothing ever came of it, but I still think about it from time to time. I did get a free pizza and potato wedges, so I thought that was cool. I really hope it was, or some kind of harmless prank. In October, for fun, I booked a tour for myself and my boyfriend done by an incredible company here in Canada. I've taken tours with them before, and I loved their storytelling, knowledge of history, and my region, and it was a nice, outdoor, socially distanced activity for my boyfriend and I. The tour itself was of a nighttime tour of a historical pioneer village with buildings dating back to the 1800s. I'd been there before many times, as it's a very popular spot for a school day trip, and overall a beautiful couple of acres of historic buildings, from across my province having been transported to recreate a historic village. The tour was going great, and the guide was telling some interesting stories and history. We had visited the barns, old mills, original house of the first family that settled there, the church and the cemetery. I hadn't felt anything all night except just some hyper-awareness of my surroundings, but as we approached a house, the guide asked if we would like to hear the next story from inside or outside the house. The group enthusiastically said inside, and the guy said, Okay, just know that you made that choice. As we entered the house, I immediately felt uneasy. The inside felt heavy, and the energy sticky. Making our way into a room, I felt my head begin to pound. I spoke up to the guide saying, I do not like this house, I'm getting a headache. Another woman in the group said she was also feeling a headache and lightheadedness. As the guide told me that many people felt that way, and they'd even had people faint inside the house on tours before, and encouraged us to step outside if we felt the same. I felt this force pushing on my shoulders, pressing them inwards, as though the house was caving in on me, pressing me in every direction. I'd never felt anything of the sort and spoke up, leaving the house with my boyfriend. He followed to make sure I was okay. As soon as my foot crossed the threshold of the house, my pounding and headache and pressure went away as though lifted off me. As I turn around to perhaps go back into the house, because I felt a little silly and wanted to hear the story, my feet would not let me go back towards it. I was physically unable to move my body in the direction of the door. The guide finished telling the story of the house and came outside to tell me the story and ensure that I was okay, while the rest of the group finished taking a look and taking flash photos to see if they could catch pictures of departed souls. It turns out the house belonged to a rather angry reverend and was originally located in my hometown about an hour and a half north. A few streets away from where I grew up, in fact. It was relocated to the historic town. The reverend was an angry man who tended to hit people with a Bible, saying he would pound the word of God into their head. This is the time I add that I do not necessarily believe in religion and consider myself more agnostic. They have also blocked off the top of the house because so many people have been pushed down the stairs by unseen hands. Children have also reported, the man upstairs does not want us up here. The rest of the tour went off without any further experiences, but that was just the strangest thing that I can't explain. I guess the Reverend did not like an agnostic godless woman in his house. I would like to share with you a story that I heard based on my experience helping out at the mosque for last year's celebrations of Eid al Adha. So I was there as a journalist working on a small island off the coast of Singapore. One of the islands have a small mosque, but they were organizing the lamb slaughtering event to give out to the poor. Many villagers, consisting mainly of Muslims and Christians, receive free meat on that day, which also contributes to the next event which is a large feast, especially for the villagers. They got the chance to aid in that, and get free food as well. 
However, one must understand that with a lot of goats, there will be a foul stench, as there will be lots of blood coming from the butchering area. By nightfall, things would have been cleaned, of course. This story is told by one of the staff there that mentions a tale that will disturb me forever. There is this story that revolves around the mosque being used by an unknown cult to summon the goat woman. They would use the praying hall in the middle of the night to do some sort of satanic ritual before sacrificing a woman, most of the time a villager, to summon the goat woman. Usually they sacrificed a young girl around her twenties, a virgin, and she was stripped of all clothing before they ended it all for her. An axe is placed on the sacrificial altar and several red candles lit up before some chanting goes about. Then the spirit of a demon would enter the deceased's body and rise, placing a decapitated goat's head still fresh on hers. Blood would drip all over her body as she picks up the axe and goes after the villagers that killed all the goats. When coming after virgins, their bodies would be affixed to crucifixes and often left on the road for villagers to see. According to an old man that lived on the island, the cult consisted of satanic worshippers that suddenly came to the island and began performing their demonic rituals one day in the forest. Ever since then, there will always be strange noises coming from the forest, the sound of goats, the screaming of women, and the stomping of large creatures. Many people did go missing, but no investigations conducted were able to find them, and so cases went cold. The villagers managed to, of course, stop the demon with their exorcism and their firearms. They summoned a religious teacher to stop the demon while a priest from a nearby church also aided the villagers. However, the account varies, as some say that she escaped into the forest with her cult, coming out each night to end the life of young virgin girls. This could be the reason why most girls are given curfews, to protect them from the goat woman. My parents were both military. They were relocated to Austin, Texas in 92. Something was delayed and their housing was put on hold. So the people in charge placed my parents into temporary housing. To my mother's horror, it was a Skullsy, very dated double wide tin trailer, which was moldy, roach and rodent infested, and the windows leaked and the place couldn't hold heat. Since my dad had to travel more than an hour to and from the base, mom was left alone for hours at night. She, one night, decided she wasn't going to wait up for my dad and turned in early. She got dressed for bed, turned on the hall light for my dad and turned out her light and laid down. Just after she closed her eyes, she let out a sigh after her head hit the pillow and all went quiet. Though suddenly she heard a shuffle sound. She was kind of confused. Dad's truck wasn't heard coming into the driveway, so he definitely wasn't home. Mum held her breath to listen, and the shuffle sound was like footsteps, with the heel lazily sliding to the floor with each step. Mum had her back to the bedroom door, and the footsteps were just wandering down the hall. It entered the bedroom. Mum propped herself on her elbows and looked over her shoulder. The light in the hall was glowing into the bedroom. Nothing was there, but the shuffle sound was right there by the bed now. Mum tried to focus on where the noise was coming from. Then, whatever it was, sat on the bed. There was nothing on the bed except for a divot on the comforter, as if someone was sitting right there in bed. Mum continued to hold her breath, calmly got up, walked over and switched on the light and shut the door behind her and fell asleep on the couch. My parents stayed in the place for just two months and nothing, fortunately, ever happened again. I have another story I wish to share. I had a co-worker called John who grew up closely to the Native American culture. So John was taught about spirits. The subject of the paranormal does not faze him. When he moved into a new house, something was different about it. It didn't bother him enough to be concerned about anything. He just got on with his life. Though after his first week, John felt pretty rubbish about being there, kind of feeling like he had to look around his environment a little bit more than usual, trying to lounge in his living room 
in the same evening, there was a knock at his front door. It was a firm knock, but not urgent. He got up, muted the TV, and went to answer it. When he got to the door and opened up, no one was there. There were no passing cars, it was a dead-end driveway, and he only had two neighbours. They were about a three-minute walk apart. There was no one. John shut the door and went back to his chair. Just as he pressed on mute, the knock happened again. It was the same firm knock. He frowned and walked back over. But again, there was no one. He shut the door and waited this time. It's a prank, friggin' kids, he thought. But not a minute later, the knock happened. And he swung the door open, and there was no one there. Just an open lawn, no trees or shrubs for hiding. He sighed, agitated but cautious, closed the door without letting go of the knob, even faster than before it knocked again. John, this time, was very agitated and really flung the door open. There definitely wasn't any time for kids to try and vanish into the darkness. John was now angry. If you don't stop this right now, I'm gonna get you. He stepped outside his door, breathed in the fresh air and listened. Nothing. John sighed in annoyance and went back inside. Nothing ever happened again. There is one final story I wish to share. Sasha had just ended a relationship. She needed to move quickly and in a hurry. A friend of hers knew a landlord who had just opened up a double wide for rent on one of their properties so it was perfect timing. Sasha signed the paperwork unseen, got the keys immediately and started moving in. The trailer was spacious. You walked into a large living space. The kitchen had an open counter bar and connected dining. Perfect, she thought. As soon as she started sorting boxes by assigned rooms, Sasha really looked around the home. To the left of the living room from the front door was a long hallway, one bedroom to the right, the bathroom to the left and down the hall, the master bedroom. Going to the master bedroom to set things up was the first thing Sasha noticed when she was taken by surprise. There on the wall was something odd. It was yarn and sticks. Macrame decorations? She got closer and realized it was very primitive, a crudely wrapped dream catcher. It's a hoop and it looked like it was about to snap. The yarn was covered in cobwebs, weaved into the yarn were your basic plastic junk beads from a kid's craft box, and there were strands of yarn hanging and twisted together in multiple knots with a chicken's foot. Gross, she thought, and tossed it out into the trash. Well, she didn't get to stay in her new place for the first two days. She had to travel a distance between her old home and stayed with her parents who had kept her dog for the transition time. But Sasha did get a chance to continue to unpack between work and her parents' house. On the third day, everything was put together enough. She collected her dog and went straight to her new home for the first full night stay. All evening, Sasha was unpacking. By the time she stopped and looked at the time, it was 2.30 a.m. Bedtime. All the lights were turned off and she settled in her room with some YouTube and her dog on the bed. At 3 a.m. Sasha noticed her dog staring out the bedroom door, ears alert, kind of tense looking. Sasha put her phone down trying to focus on her own scenes when she heard it. Small, evenly timed thuds. It was faint, but Sasha could hear someone walking around her living room. She lived alone. The doors and windows were locked, or at least they should have been. There's no way anyone could have broken in without making much more noise. Fear tightened in her chest. Then the footsteps stopped and suddenly, the steps came thudding down the hallway. She sat straight up in bed, her dog barking, hackles raised, but refused to leave her side. A thud of running feet came to a stop right at her bedroom door. Sasha then heard laughter, a giggle of a small child and then feet running again down the hallway. Screw this, Sasha said. She got up, ran to her door, slammed it shut, slid her dresser across the entry, and the next morning, 
she found small childlike sized handprints all over the window in the living room. It wasn't her imagination from staying up late, so it seemed. She called a friend who knew a girl who would do house cleanses with sage and prayer. It worked because after that she never found or heard anything inexplicable again. It wasn't until I brought up the subject of voodoo religion of how hanging a chicken's foot above your door is supposed to ward off evil. So Sasha believes that maybe the crusty or dream catcher was holding something at bay. Nothing further ever happened between the cleansing, but still, I kind of wonder about the old dream catcher, possibly warding away a spirit who couldn't rest. This happened to my dad. I forget where they were stationed, Hong Kong perhaps, but he and his buddy, a seasoned soldier, had some time off and they decided to see if they could hunt some wild boars which were prevalent where they were stationed. They would be heroes if they returned with a pig or two. As he and his buddy trudged through waist high bush and tall palm trees, they came to a clearing where they could see off into the distance, a whole load of some pretty choice pork out grazing and their mouths watered. My dad asked, how do we shoot one without the rest coming after us? His buddy replies, you shoot the leader and the rest will run away. Especially if they have babies, they will run away at all costs to protect them. So they watched the pigs for a long time, creeping closer so that they could get a good shot. They both finally decide which one was the leader and they both took aim and shot him, dropping him where he stood. They waited for the rest of the Saunder to run with them, but they ran towards the two men that ended their leader's life and my dad's buddy was correcting saying that they would do anything to protect their babies but they did not back down. They can run up to 30 miles an hour and can weigh sometimes as much as 600 pounds and will fight with everything they have. The soldiers were in a field of waist high bush with nothing but palm trees and they threw their rifles and shimmied up two palm trees while the Saunder squealed and gathered around the base. As you can imagine, it was quite difficult to hang onto the trees with no branches to hold onto, especially just a straight trunk. Every time they thought the pigs were leaving, they would get the scent of their dead leader and squeal again and surround the base of the trees. The squealing rarely stopped and was almost as bad as trying to hang onto the straight trunk of a palm tree. They would get the scent of the guys and would begin their squealing again in earnest. Now you may be thinking, this was just a bunch of wild pigs. What damage could they do? Well, wild pigs were one of the most dangerous animals you have to fight off. Their tusks and teeth are like razor blades and they're fearless, often killing lions that come after their babies. They can throw you off your feet and then they can use their tusks and very large and hard heads to plunge into you causing fatalities. This went on for several hours. They would move and the pigs would squeal. Finally, when the pigs were far enough away, they silently shimmied down the trees and ran back to base without slowing down, leaving their dinner and their rifles where they lay. They both had MREs for dinner and never told any of their fellow soldiers about the dinner they almost had that night. First, I have to tell you that I've never been in trouble with the law and I've never stolen anything in my life. This is relevant to the story. This all occurred in the summer of 2014 when I was 16. I live in the second largest town in Washington state, but still a relatively small town by most of America's standards. Our first Walmart Supercenter was still relatively new in 2004 and was only 10 to 15 minutes away from my house. So my family and I went there quite a bit for most of our needs. We got to know most of the employees and we had never had a problem with any of them until one day I noticed someone following me. Okay, I thought that's odd, but didn't think too much of it and continued shopping with my family. But whenever I got that feeling, this one guy would always be around. I told my family what was going on, so we would all keep an eye out for this weird guy. 
He didn't look weird or out of the ordinary. He was probably in his mid to late twenties, about five six, average build, red hair, goatee, and he usually wore a baseball hat. We figured out that he was one of those security secret shopper people that a lot of retail stores hire. Well, this continued for about a month or longer, but as time went on, the creepy guy got more confident. Not only was he following me, but he was peeking through racks of clothes between shelves at the end of aisles and darting in and out of aisles between me. It didn't even matter to him that my family was always with me. My mom wouldn't let me go anywhere in the store alone. Not that I wanted to. I was a scared little 16 year old girl and I wasn't about to go anywhere without someone with me. It got to the point where we were afraid he would wait until I left the store to follow me to our car and perhaps follow us home. Thank goodness that never happened, but who knew what the guy was capable of. My mum and I decided to confide in one of the cashiers that we'd gotten to know really well. She walked around with me and the guy was nowhere to be found. Needless to say, she didn't believe me and thought I was insane. The day finally came when everything blew up, figuratively speaking. My mum, both my older sisters, my very little niece who was only a few months old and I had to go to Walmart. The trip to the store started out okay with no sign of the creepy dude anywhere. So I was having a pretty good time when the feeling of being watched came and my head began spinning. I thought, oh no, not him again. There he was peeking at me, darting through the aisles, you know, the usual. We hurried and got our things and went to check out. Mr. Guy had never followed me to the cash register before, but he did that day. I was standing there waiting for the cashier to finish ringing up our things when my mum noticed him in the women's clothing aisle near to where we were checking out. My mum had enough. She walked a little closer to him and asked him angrily, what the hell do you think you're doing following my daughter around? If you don't leave her alone, I'll call the cops. He then replied, I can follow and watch whoever I want. So my mum stomped over to the register fuming, paid for our things and loudly said, that's it, we're getting a manager. So my family and I went to customer service and while my mum was demanding a manager, the cashier was snooty and acted like I was in the wrong, go figure. I kept scanning my surroundings to find him. It was 10 minutes before the manager showed up. And when we finally did, my mum and I explained what had been going on and offered for him to look through our pockets, purses and things. He refused and said he believed us. He got the assistant manager and asked me to walk around the store where they'd followed the way behind to watch what happened. Sure enough, the creepy guy starts following me and they catch him red handed. They took him to the back room and that was the last I saw of him. It took me a long time to go anywhere alone again after that. I thank God I have such a supportive mum and family. Otherwise it probably could have ended much differently because I wouldn't have had the support and protection I did. Please be aware of your surroundings, even in places you think should be safe. And to the creepy guy, let's not meet. About 30 years ago, I used to work for a pizzeria in the small town in which I live. It's the kind of place where you know pretty much everyone who you bump into on your route, who you're delivering to. Anyway, we were understaffed that day. I was also answering the phones while I was waiting for my replacement, as technically I was the delivery driver. This wasn't an uncommon thing I had to do, as we were always incredibly understaffed. It was an independent, low budget pizzeria, and the guy was stingy as hell when it came to working. I get this call, and it's an old lady. We hadn't heard from her in absolutely ages. I'd say at least a year. But she sometimes ordered pizzas. Hawaiian. So, we get the order. However, there's something weird about this phone call. She doesn't say hello or anything like she usually would. When the phone answers, she's just saying she'd like a Hawaiian pizza, and then hangs up the phone. She didn't even say where to. Again, small town. I guess she either assumed we knew who she was and where she lived. Well, I think that's the only reason really. In any case, we know who she is. 
she's on our system. We double check, make the pizza, and about 20 minutes later when my replacement arrives, I can finally start making my way. This old lady lived a bit out in the sticks. It's a small town, so the sticks aren't exactly far. And after 10 minutes do I reach a little rural cottage out in the middle of basically nowhere. All the lights were off when I first approached the house, which gave me a very weird vibe and made me feel quite unsettled. I grabbed my flashlight and peeked out and flashed it towards the door, seeing if there was a paper note or anything saying she'd be right back, but there was no such thing. I hesitantly stepped out, grabbed the pizza from the back seat and started making my way towards the door. I knocked a few times on the door and waited, tapping my feet, expecting her to answer the door any moment now, keeping in mind her age and the fact she might be delayed. I remember it was cold as I was standing out there, the only warmth coming from the pizza on top of my hands. I waited for about two to three minutes, growing ever more bored. That's when I decided to knock again. I knocked firmly and said, hello, it's the pizza. I waited two more minutes. I was starting to get annoyed. So I started looking around the house to see if perhaps she hadn't heard me or was in another room. I looked with my flashlight just to double check this was starting to get weird. Just at the point where I thought perhaps I should go back, did it strike me that I should go round the house and check the garden or something? Perhaps in some bizarre turn of events, she walked outside and got locked out. It wasn't a gate or anything, so, being sort of hesitant still, I opted to walk around and just double check. For her safety too. I reached the back of her house and she's got these big glass windows that are basically the size of a door that look out into her garden. Just as I turn on my flashlight to look inside, do I see a sight I'll never forget. The woman is lying on the floor. I panic. I freak out. I grab my phone and start dialing, trying to get in contact with my manager. Only then does it hit me that if something's happened to her, I really should be calling the authorities. So quickly hang up and dial an ambulance. From there, it was a whole thing with EMTs and the police. And to cut a long story short, it turned out she'd been dead a while. At least a few days by their reckoning. It was very cold in the house and winter, so at least her body hadn't entered a big state of decay. But the real question on my mind was how could a dead body order a pizza? There was no one in the house, the police confirmed it, and I was physically there when they went in and broke the door down. It was a very uncomfortable situation. Obviously the pizza went cold, and me and the police and the EMTs ended up eating it. But even so, it's one of these things in life that I really can't explain. We didn't record our calls, but I remember receiving it, writing down the order and the whole process like it was just yesterday. And it really gets me thinking, does anyone have an explanation for how this came to be? Maybe she just wanted one last pizza before she crossed over. Guess I'll never know. Many people become familiar with the concept of astral travel. Supposedly, this is the ability to separate one's astral body. The only other way I can think to express it is the soul from one's body. So the soul can take spirit journeys to other realms while one's body is left safely at home. Shamans in many cultures throughout history have presumably trained themselves to take such journeys often in order to gain occult knowledge or insight about the future or about someone's health. In any case, there have also been reports of spontaneous astral travel where the event just happens to a person without their conscious control. People 
who suffer near-death experiences often report their souls rising up and looking down at their bodies below. I once had no opinion about astral travel. One way or another, I neither disbelieved nor believed it. I simply didn't know. Then, an experience happened to me. It started out much like any other night, except that I felt more tired than usual and had decided to retire early. I recall it was a lovely winter night, very close to the Yule tide, and a gentle snow was falling outside. I snuggled down in bed to listen to my favorite YouTube channel, preparing myself for sleep. I felt very comfortable and was drifting off when I felt an unaccustomed lifting and a sense of weightlessness. I felt as though I were floating and suspended in air rather than sinking into the oblivion of unconscious as usual, and that my consciousness had shifted. I was hyper alert, more even then than in a waking state. I opened my eyes and lo and behold, I found myself floating near the ceiling, looking down at my inert body, peacefully laying in bed, fully illuminated by the glow of my laptop screen. I marveled at the situation I had not sought this. I had not expected it. It was simply happening without any effort on my part. Oddly, I felt no fear, none at all. I just assumed I was dreaming. Was this what people called the lucid dream? Is so-called astral travel and so-called lucid dreaming one and the same? I had no idea. I just found myself, some part of myself, marveling at the experience. Two things I remember were the sense of weightlessness and lack of any physical discomfort. I felt buoyant and light. I'm rather excited by it all. I also felt a strong desire to leave, to fly. The nearby windows beckoned me and before I knew it, I was on the other side of it. Opening it had not been necessary. I didn't feel the coldness of winter but I was flying very swiftly through it, as if on the power of a single thought. Soon I found myself above a vast, dark ocean. The water looked very cold and unbroken, as far as my eyes could see. Soon I reached land again and found myself in a town. It wasn't any town I was familiar with. The houses seemed strange. They looked old. They were all covered in the same wooden, clapboard sliding, stained deep brown and unpainted. All of these buildings were close together, attached in fact, as townhouses are. Some of the buildings had three or four floors, others were lower, but they were all attached. I don't know why, but I got the impression I might be in a Scandinavian country, although I'd never been there. The night was very dark and seemed very cold and snowflakes were drifting around the air. I found myself being drawn to one particular lighted window among this pile of buildings, one of the taller houses. Before I knew it, I was inside the window and inside the house. It became apparent there was a party going on. It was the Yule party. There was much light, laughter and chatting People were moving about, sitting and standing with drinks in hand or dressed quite nicely. I specifically remember a tall, attractive blonde man leaning against a counter that separated the wide entrance hall from the open plan kitchen living room area where many people were. He was wearing a lovely knitted jumper, holding a drink and chatting with another man. I moved closer, only they had no cognizance of me at all. Clearly, I was not visible to them. I didn't overly marvel at this interesting situation. I more or less accepted it and moved on from room to room, exploring the house. What seemed most amazing to me was just how vivid everything seemed. I could discern every detail from my surroundings, the furnishing, the people, the activity. After making a circuit of the downstairs rooms, I came out once more into the wide entrance hall, which included a wide staircase of dark hardwood balustrade, with the same on both sides. 
The wood was rather scuffed and worn with age, but the whole house, although clearly older, was comfortable and had good vibes. There were two children on the stairs looking between the ages of eight and ten, chatting and playing happily. I approached them with the idea of moving beyond them and hence up the stairway to explore, but then something shocking happened. The girl looked straight at me, her eyes wide, her face filled with utter terror, and before I knew it, she screamed. This all happened so fast, I remember thinking, you can actually see me? For some reason, I was visible to this one child. In an instant, I felt myself being pulled back. It was rather like the sensation of a telescope being retracted. The entire scene before me collapsed, and then I was back in bed awake, with the voice from my laptop droning away next to me, much like I am to you now. This experience remains for me one of the most profound that I could perhaps label as paranormal, although it was very different to the ones that you usually hear about. Usually a narrator recalls an experience of seeing a ghost, often when they were a child. In this instance, albeit still alive, I was the ghost. It's perfectly natural, I suppose, for people to react with fear and shock when they see someone or something that shouldn't be there. I suspect I might feel the same. But I wonder if every encounter of this sort need to be seen as malevolent. Perhaps so many so-called ghosts are merely what I was on that particular winter night, an unexpected soul traveler who finds themselves glimpsing in places just as strange to them as they may seem to the rare and gifted person capable of detecting their presence. Since this time I have begun a course of self-training and today I am capable of taking astral or lucid soul journeys at will. I've been to many places and met many interesting people on these journeys and have gained much insight, but have never encountered the little girl again. My experiences thus far have shifted my former view of what I define as supernatural. Maybe some day such experiences will become perfectly natural, and maybe one day we will recognize ghosts as just fellow souls who, voluntary or not, have a go at parting some interdimensional curtain. My story starts when I was stationed in the US Army, in Fort Drum, New York. I lived on a base in a garden style apartment. Now I had given someone I knew a spare key to get in if I was away. There had been someone who lived in the upstairs apartment and the two beside me. One night I heard the sound of a rocking chair. I didn't think anything of it until it wouldn't stop. So I being my short tempered self, banged on the ceiling with a broom and went back to sleep. Then I heard what sounded like footsteps in my front room. I thought maybe it was just the neighbors upstairs hearing the noise again. So I got out of bed to see if it was the person I knew with my spare keys. Nope, nothing, and no one was out there. I went to turn off my bathroom light and went back to my bedroom and laid back down, then felt that there was a man standing over me. So again, I thought it was a friend of mine, but no one was in the room. I don't know what it was about that, but every hair on my body stood on end and I felt chills. I then, bravely, pulled the covers over my head. Then I felt it again, but this time there was a very distinct growling in my ear, almost like a large dog or wolf perhaps. It freaked me out. I jumped up, slammed on my bedroom door and locked it. Luckily it was a Friday and I didn't have to go in the next day freaky right. I've tried to remain skeptical about this, even though it's not the first experience I've had. The story I'm about to share with you happened a very long time ago. I didn't come from the most affluent family, but they were still generally nice people. The one thing I lacked deeply, however, was a rooted self-confidence. I was never a very attractive girl, the kind that would often get mocked. In any case, 
has led to some poor life choices later down the line. And that is where the story truly begins. I started hanging out with the ne'er do wells of my school, a guy called Brad in particular. I thought he was different, and that he saw me for who I truly was, and not just a slab of meat, like some other guys see girls. However, Brad had certain vices, but nonetheless, I was infatuated, and I wanted to be with him. Reflecting on it now, I'm unsure if he was just with me out of convenience, but we'll get there eventually. We were 16, turning 17. Brad had pretty much free reign of his house. He lived with his mother who was hardly ever home, and as a wayward 16 year old boy, started taking narcotics. One of the things he invited me to do was to go live round his house. And after a particularly nasty argument with my parents, I decided I was leaving. I packed my bags and left to live with him. I dropped out of school and we didn't have any money. His mum would be gone at least three weeks and the little she had left him for groceries was pretty much depleted. But there was one asset in my life that I could use, my car. So I put it to good use and got a job with a friend at a local pizza joint and started working as a delivery driver. All the money that I earned was pretty much blown on Brad's drug habits. He'd often invite him and his friends over on payday, buy a heap load of stuff and blow all our money in one hit. I often had to hide some of my money sometimes just so that we could afford to buy groceries. I soon realized that my life was miserable. And after about two months of this, I was getting tired of being treated like dirt and realized I wasn't as valued as I thought I was. I started debating leaving Brad and going home and telling my parents how I decided to leave school. All things that really scared me but not as much as what's about to happen to me. It was a regular night. Like I said from explaining my situation, we really needed money. So I was working until the very last shift at the hope of getting a decent tip to really make ends meet this week. I had my aim at five more dollars in my tip jar and then I could go home satisfied. This was the final order of the night. Our pizza joint closed at midnight and it was about 11.40 when the order came in. So once the pizza was successfully loaded in the back of my car, was I ready to head out and head home right after the delivery? I start making my way. It was a fairly rough area, but unavoidable. We often got deliveries to deliver to this part specifically. So I'm on my way. I'm about five minutes from the delivery address when I quickly pull over to consult the sheet of paper where it was written down. I drive for another five minutes and when I'm pretty sure I'm at the address, I'm scanning each and every house, checking the numbers. It was something like 32. I was passing 26, 28. And when I finally get up to 32, the house looks vacant. I start getting a bit creeped out. I wonder if I got the right place or not. Bear in mind, this was before the prevality of cell phones and I didn't have the luxury of owning one. I'd probably have just driven back to the shop if it weren't almost guaranteed to be closed by the time I get back. As it was a small place, my manager expected me to just give him the money during my next shift. It was sort of cool in that regard. I stop outside the house and ponder for a moment, waiting, hoping that someone will just stroll out when they see a random car parked there and knock on the window for the pizza, but no such luck. I do a deep breath, step out, grab the pizza and start making my way to the dark front door. The streetlights almost seem to flicker for a moment 
like it was out of a movie. I shudder and bang on the door a few times, calling out, Pizza delivery! I wait for a minute, but there's no response. Just as I'm about to head back to the car, feeling quite deflated, do I hear shuffling behind the door. That's when it starts creeping open, but no one comes out. I call out again, but I've already made my way down the first few steps. Hi, I'm here to deliver your pizza. Nothing. I wait a little while longer to see if anyone's going to come out. And that's when I hear it. What sounds like a scream come from the upstairs part of the house. I look up and don't see anyone. At this point, I think I'm going to wet my pants. So just as I'm about to run, does the door open fully. And there's a man there in nothing but socks and underpants. He gives me this most horrific looking grin and starts walking towards me. Bear in mind how poor I am. I really wanted to run, but I also wanted that tip desperately. So I stood there as he approached me and grabbed the pizzas with a friendly smile. He said in a very cold voice, I'll be back in a sec with the money. I thought deep down that perhaps this had just been a misunderstanding. Maybe he was nice underneath it all, I told myself. That's when out of the bushes nearby jumped three dudes wearing ski masks. They all started screaming at me to give the money, but I told them I didn't have any money. They started yelling at me and telling me to move it into the house. This had been some kind of setup. Just before I reached the entrance, does one of the guys stop and pull me back? Brenda? He removes his mask, lowers it, and I see it's one of the guys that Brad is always hanging out with. His name was Mark. I just about crapped my pants. I asked him what the hell he was doing and why he was doing that. And he tried to explain that he just needed a little cash and thought he'd get a pizza for free, you know? and tried giving me all this spiel. These were the kind of guys my boyfriend, darling boyfriend, was with all the time. One of the guys who was blowing all our funds on all kinds of illegal stuff. I kind of laughed it off, more out of fear than anything. They never paid me for the pizza, but I didn't care. When I got back home, Brad was asleep. Passed out from being high, I'm sure. I gathered my stuff and left. Nearly being robbed or worse was the wake-up call I needed to realize I needed to get my life together. So I did. I am from Germany. Back in 2011, our family moved from my childhood home village to a nearby town called Buchberg. We moved into a half-timbered house from the 16th century, which was a listed building. My mother had just taken over a restaurant and was always very stressed at this point. I was 12 years old and had to grow up very early because my mother had to be able to rely on me while she had to take care of her restaurant. Me and my sister's room were outside my parents' apartment and had a real front door, so to speak of. As it was such an old building, the floor consisted almost entirely of wooden floorboards, which, in isolated places, creaks quite thickly when you step on them. One of those places was right at the entrance of my room, maybe two or three steps away from the door, which was also one of the loudest places you could step on. But these spots only creaked when there was lengthy weight on it, so it wasn't enough if I threw a shirt there or something. After living there for about a year and a half, I woke up for the first time through the creaking of the floorboards in the middle of the night, which I couldn't really understand at this point since I only woke up. And since I couldn't find an explanation, I dismissed it as a normal sound made by the wood and went back to sleep with a quite easy feeling. For weeks, nothing happened until I woke up again to this squeaking. This time, not as sleepy as the last. I quickly realized it wasn't normal. It was loud and violent, as if someone was standing on the squeaky spot intentionally. 
I thought I was going completely crazy and could no longer trust my perception after the floorboards did not stop creaking for more than a minute. I couldn't take it anymore and ran over to my mother's bedroom and told her crying what was going on. My mother still thinks that I dreamt it. And so the squeak happened every now and then and over time I gradually lost the fear of it. It was around nine or 10 months since the first incident when something new happened. The door would open and close by itself. One of our faucets suddenly turned on in the middle of the night and our cats would just stare at nothing and start hissing and growling. The longer we lived there, my entire gut feeling became increasingly more uncomfortable. I would more often than not feel that I wasn't alone. It was almost as if I had someone sitting on my shoulder who was with me no matter where I was. It was almost overwhelming. And then there was the one night after which I couldn't sleep in my room for three weeks or so. I was in my bed just before falling asleep in the evening when that stupid squeaking of the floorboard started again. In the meantime, more annoyed than fearful, I pressed my pillow onto my ears in the hopes that it would soon stop. But this time it was different. It didn't stop after the usual two to three minutes, but went on for 15 and slowly got louder and more intense until I looked up at some point. What I saw almost gave me a heart attack and I could literally feel a shockwave go through my whole body together with goosebumps. I was so scared that I nearly vomited. I saw someone standing at the foot of my bed about five feet away just staring. Because of the shock, I was frozen and stared back for what felt like ages. In these fractional moments, I could see what was there. It looked like an old woman with a long shirt and curly hair. This expression on her face, it was disappointed, almost angry. But as I saw and realized all these things, she was gone again. I slept on our couch for a few more weeks. My mother didn't want to believe all of this. It seemed to me as if I were the only one who had noticed all these strange things. I think it was anywhere from a month to three months after the night I saw the old woman. At that point, I turned 14. I came home from the cinema where I watched the second part of the Hobbit series with buddies. Later that evening, I was lying in my bed, thinking about the film and what happened in it. When from one second to the other, the floorboards began creaking again. That was the first time after the incident with the old woman that it squealed again and fear rose up me like I'd never felt it before. I had hoped so much that the noises would just stop right away, but I was wrong. It was just like the last time, but this time I did not dare look to what made the noise. As I was lying there and the noises didn't stop, a feeling came over me but it won't stop until I looked. Finally, I gave in. And when I looked, I was as shocked as the first time to see another person standing there, but this time someone different from the old woman, a man in his mid thirties with old clothes and a helmet with a broken lamp and a dirty face. Like the old woman, he just stood there and stared at me for a few seconds, wearing the same expression as her before he vanished. Fortunately for me, we moved out a few weeks later, which is how everything ended and since then nothing has happened to me. I myself never believed in such things as the paranormal and even made fun of people who said they did. But I don't tell this to anyone now because no one believes me and they'll think I'm crazy for believing it myself. I can't categorize it properly, but I'm sure that I have some kind of trauma for it and I'm confident that ghosts are real. I would always take the shortcut through a local cemetery from my friend's house to my house. I wasn't afraid of it. I knew the caretaker and all the dogs that roamed the place. So I'm on my way back. I get into the middle of the cemetery and I can see candles lit and people standing around it. I skirt around them and they are all chanting something in Spanish. I'm able to make out a few chickens in a pen, but they're all chanting and praying. The next day I return on my bike, go to the same spot and find little bowls filled with chicken eyes and hearts. I was only around 17 at the time, but apparently I happened upon a group of people practicing Santeria. 
It freaked me out at first, and when I learned a little more about it, I realized it was not much to fear. Unfortunately, I didn't learn more about it for a few years. Creepy as hell, especially seeing the remains of the chicken the very next day. This is a story of one of the scariest and strangest things that's ever happened to me. Let me go from the beginning. One morning, I got a lift to work with a lady that I work with. As we were driving, a native bird thuds into the windscreen and bounces off. We both got a fright. I wanted to stop to see if the bird was okay, but the driver insisted on driving on and that it was probably dead. I felt bad. I am an animal lover, but you know what it's like when you have to get to work and time is gonna be tight for the entire day. That night I get home. I'm hanging out in my bedroom when I start hearing what sounds like a person making these groaning and crazy murmuring sounds right outside my bedroom window. I'm home alone and frozen in fear. The sound seems to move around my room to the back of the house until it disappears after about 15 minutes. I didn't look out there because I was scared, but I've lived here for over 15 years and have never heard anything like it before or since. That night I wake up from a dead sleep and hear something hiss right in my face. But the creepiness does not end there. A few days later, I'm at someone's home doing some housework for them. They aren't home and I'm alone. And I go to pet their cat who was sitting aloof on a chair by a huge window on the second story floor that looks out over the driveway. And as I'm looking out the window, this poor little sparrow comes flying straight into the window right in front of me, knocks itself out cold and falls quite a distance down onto the concrete driveway. I go down to the bird, which seems to be okay, but just in shock. So in order to protect it from the cat, I make a nice little hospital bed for it in a shoebox with air holes and put it safely in the garage to recover for a while. I go upstairs to do the ironing. I'm in a room standing with my back to the corner with just the bookshelves behind me. It's very still and it's a peaceful room with no draft nor movement coming in from any direction. Nothing. I'm ironing a sheet and thinking back to the bird we hit on our way to work. The creepy as hell noises outside my bedroom, the hiss, and now this bird. Thinking that it's kind of creepy that this bird stuff keeps happening to me. At that very moment, I hear something slide off the bookshelf and fall to the carpet. Guess what it was? It was a heavy ornament of a bird. I stared at it for several seconds, completely perplexed. I promise you it did not just fall off the shelf, I specifically heard it slide. This thing was heavy. I went and let the bird go, which was fine. And after that, nothing else happened. This was about five years ago. Was the bird haunting me? Camp Dragoon in Iraq had weird things happen in different places. The camp was just an old Saddam regime secret police complex, so plenty of people disappeared there, just to add to the horrific background. The underground tunnel torture chambers had been walled off early, but people who went down there often reported the feeling of being watched. I took pictures in an old prison and weird balls of light showed up, and when I got them developed by the locals, I chalked it up to there being dust in the air. The one thing that happened over and over though, were the lights in the buildings appearing where they shouldn't be. I was part of the quick reaction force for the camp and was called out many times to look for intruders. We had an apartment building on our camp, unused but off limits, and at least once a month, a guard tower, the tactical operations center, or random people would report faint lights moving within. Every time we got spun up and cleared the whole building, but not even the dust had been disturbed. People being tired, reflections, soldiers being sneaky, I don't know, but it's weird and unexplained. I won't spread any of the National Training Center ghost stories I've heard as they didn't happen to me. 
and they could be just legends at this point, but it sure as hell was freaky at the time. I used to deliver pizzas for a pizzeria in Cape Town, South Africa, when I was in university to make extra cash. I used to deliver to the same house quite often. Incidentally, this place was quite close to where I lived at the time. There was nothing overtly strange about this place, except that whoever would receive the pizzas would normally take quite a long time to come to the door and would always ask me to pass them pizza through the security gate instead of unlocking it and making it easier for everyone involved. One quiet night a call comes through for this house and I collect the pizzas and get to the house reasonably quickly. This time a lady who I'd never seen before is at the house. She opens the door and lets me in. It's not entirely uncommon to be let into a customer's house, so I don't think anything of it. She points me towards the kitchen, which is down quite a long corridor, and asks me to drop the pizzas off there. She follows me all the way, still nothing weird. The passage opened up to an open plan dining room and lounge area. Through this area is the kitchen through a door on the left. As I was passing through the dining room slash lounge area, I saw for something that sticks with me to this day. An old looking dentist chair with a person lying in it. Whether the person was alive or not, I still don't know. He had a sheet covering his whole body, except the very top of his head and his feet, which were duct taped together. I couldn't tell if he was breathing or not. The lady that opened the door was still right behind me. She said absolutely nothing. We went into the kitchen and she paid me for the pizzas. At this point, I was either expecting to be attacked by this lady or someone else hiding somewhere or to be scared by the guy under the sheet as some part of a practical joke. Not wanting to give anything away, I didn't say anything and prepared myself to either defend myself or not be frightened should it be a joke. I walk out towards the front door, double checking to see what I saw was correct and not just my imagination. The lady still behind me all the way closed the door behind me as I left and said nothing. To this day, I still have no idea what was happening in that house. It could have just been some joke, but I really don't think it was. The presence of a dentist chair still makes no sense and I didn't see anything else that would suggest the residents of the house collected weird paraphernalia. I drive past that house quite often and still wonder if I was in any real danger. It was October 11th, 2001, one month after 9-11. I was 14 years old and my grandfather died in his sleep, an empty bottle of whiskey at his bedside. I was devastated. He was the best grandpa, and I could tell I was his favorite. At his funeral, I remember standing at his burial ceremony. I was a little further back than most of our family. I needed my space and I was grieving hard. I remember closing my eyes, folding my arms, and burying my head into my jacket, then crying. My mom then put her arm around me and cried with me. I felt her, heard her crying into my cheek, her voice mauled by my jacket. She let go and I opened my eyes. What I saw made my heart skip a beat. My mother was standing 20 feet in front of me. Everyone was. I looked around and realized I was completely alone the whole time. I don't know who hugged me. Maybe it was my grandpa. Maybe I mistook my grandpa's voice for my mother's. And to this day, I'm still a little bit creeped out. It was a calm, warm summer night in July. The first year of high school was over and me and my two friends, Marcus and Marcus, were hanging out. The night sky was dark enough to see some stars and there was stillness in the air. It was so still, as a matter of fact, that there was a complete absence of any wind whatsoever that night. It gave off an uncanny feeling that my friends and I seemed to ignore as we roamed the town streets looking for stupid fun things to do. After messing around for a very long time, we decided to take a break 
in the middle of a large outdoor sports complex that we had to pass through on our walk back to Marcus's house, where we had been hanging out earlier that day. At that point, it was a little after midnight, and we decided to sit far inside the complex on the curb of the road that goes through it. This road separates many of the sports fields from the dark, dense trees and woods that border all around the large secluded complex. We all happen to have been sitting in one of the most isolated parts of the complex, with only a large post above us to see. The light from it only reached across the road and stopped instantly against the wall of the forest on the opposite side of the curb we sat on. We sat there, staring into the trees in front of us, talking for another hour about things I can't remember, and sitting in our oasis of flickering lamplight. Little did we know what could have been lurking in the desert of pitch black darkness that encompassed us. Even with this almost sinister setting, we unknowingly found ourselves in, the night still continued to maintain its tranquil absence of wind like a calm before the storm. Behind us was a large fence, a large field behind that, another fence, another large field behind that, and even more bordering trees behind that. All of it cloaked in a thick blanket of darkness, similar to the woods that loomed across the road directly in front of us. On the left side of us was that dead end of a road and some large metal crates. On our right side was down the road that led past more fences and fields, eventually leading to a parking lot in the exit. As we continued to talk through the night, still slightly amped up on caffeine from all the soda we drank earlier, I lost track of what my two friends were talking about and drifted my attention out of the conversation for a moment to check my phone. After that very moment, it was when I started to hear sounds multiple human-like voices coming from far behind us. If I had to guess where it was coming from, based on the direction and the volume, it was probably around the forest, where it meets the furthest field far behind us, somewhere hidden in the dark. What I heard was a very eerie chanting in a language I'd never heard. Whatever it was, I could tell that multiple people were chanting it, and it was giving me serious negative energy that sent chills down my spine. I kept looking at my phone trying to tune it out and focus my attention on some memes, but it was too chilling to ignore. I then turned to look at my friends, hoping to jump back into the conversation and forget about the voices, but before I did this I suddenly realised they had already stopped talking too. When I turned silently to both look at them, I then saw that they too had also turned, looking back at me with the same spooked facial expression. My friend Marcus says, Dude, do you hear that creepy chanting? I reply, Yeah, it's freaking me out. At the exact moment I said that, as if on cue, an immense gust of wind rips through the trees in front of us, spiralling in extreme commotion, tearing through the once calm air. The canopies of trees surrounding all around us were shaking and bending in the wind, with the sound of leaves rattling loud as ever, and the continuous chanting that still lingered in the distance. All three of us immediately and simultaneously stood up at the exact same time. It was as if a lightning strike of fear had jolted up us, and right as we got up, and before we could even say a word, a sudden extreme loud sound blast from within the roaring forest right in front of us. The best I can compare it to is a combination between a gong being hammered, and a scream slash growl and low rumble. But even that description is an understatement. This sound was otherworldly and still haunts me to this day. That was it. Me and my friends didn't know what to say to each other, nor looked at each other. We all knew we needed to get out of there, and we needed to get out of there as quickly as possible. In almost perfect synchronization, we all unanimously turned, swung ourselves over the fence to the right of us in one jump and straight into a soccer field, where we sprinted as fast as our legs could carry us. I never ran so fast in my life. I wasn't thinking about anything but the utter shock of what had just happened. My body, 
practically carried me across the dark void of terror that was the field. We were running in the direction of Marcus's neighborhood, just to get to the safety of his house. As we were running, the wind is still furiously blowing and I still hear the faint, distant chants cutting through the breeze. Out of the corner of my eye I see a blur of flickering candle lights in an organized formation near the tree border, in the distance behind us. We eventually had to crawl through a hole in another fence to get out of the field, and then we ran full speed all the way through some foliage to get to Marcus's house. We entered the house, slammed the door shut, locked it, and collapsed on the couch. To this day, I am still disturbed by that night, still question what those voices were and how the wind kicked up so quickly and furiously. The origins of that otherworldly sound and the near perfect synchronized order of the phenomenon. My personal theory is that the chanting was a form of distant demonic ritual that conjured up some type of otherworldly portal very close to us. Who knows though, what really was going on there that night. I'm just glad we got away. When I was about 12, I lived in a house on the outskirts of Havre, Montana. It was just me and my parents, a small two-story house with a little attic. Both me and my parents stayed on the second floor, their bedroom right next to mine. And there was a closet and bathroom up there too. There was a second bedroom on the bottom floor that we used as a storage room. All my life I have been more susceptible to seeing and sensing things. So the first day that we were at the house, I kept getting this strange feeling throughout. And this would persist the entire time we lived there. While we still had all our stuff piled around the house, we would notice that sometimes things wouldn't be where we had last left them. We would also hear noises downstairs like knocks and bumps and other things. The kind of stuff that's normal in a house. But after about a month of living there, things like doors would open and shut and footsteps would be heard throughout the house. At night, I wouldn't be able to sleep because there would be noises in the attic. After a few months, things started turning violent. Things would fly off the counter and doors would slam shut and the footsteps turned into stomping. My dad got shoved down the stairs one time. There was one night that I will never forget. I kept my door open because I didn't want to be woken up if it was opened. It slammed shut at some point in the night. I don't remember what time it was, but there was a huge bang coming from every wall in the ceiling. It was so intense that pictures fell off the wall. I screamed for my parents and it stopped and they came running in and asked me what was wrong. I asked if they'd heard the banging and they all said they hadn't. I was so scared and confused. I slept with my parents for a while after that. Things kept happening. A glass was thrown at my mum and I got locked in a storage room. After a while, my parents figured something was very wrong with the house so they sold it and we moved to where I'm living now. I still think about that house and the things that went on there. And I'm glad that I'm never going back. A few days ago, I ordered a delivery service via an app called Rappi that works in South America, where I live. And to be able to get the delivery, you obviously have to give the details like your cell phone number and house address. When I received the delivery, the guy started flirting with me and began asking me weird questions. I told him I was only 16, hoping that he would leave me alone, but he just tried to keep making conversation. But I told him to have a good day and shut the door. Fast forward to yesterday in the afternoon. Someone called my house phone number. Keep in mind that I don't give out that information in my app. And my mum picked up the phone and the man told her that he wanted to talk to me, calling me by name. She asked who he was and he told her he was one of my school friends. My mum gave me the phone and the man told me who he was and gave me his name, which later turned out to be fake and said I was very hot and that he wanted to meet up with me. I immediately hung up the phone. 
I started looking through the Rappi app and see if there was some way to report this guy, but I couldn't find anything. Then I tried to search in the delivery history and couldn't find anyone with the name he told me. I'm really creeped out right now because I don't know how he found out my house phone number. And he also knows exactly where I live. It's a pretty tricky situation. I just hope he never tries to reach out to me again. I live in a town that was founded around 1830 and has seen more than its fair share of death, war, and massacres. So much so that lots of people are claimed to be haunted here and you can walk over spots that hundreds perished on. I would even wager to say that the land I currently live on has most likely had a few soldiers die on both sides of the civil war. Now, to what I experienced. I woke up one night past midnight, my dog rolled over in bed, and I opened my eyes in the near pitch black room with a view of the corner next to my covered window. And from the corner of my eye, I see something moving by the opposite side of the room. And there it is. A man dressed in a dirty, but not torn or raggedy Confederate uniform. I was afraid someone had broken in, but before I could even decide what to do, he floated with his head, nearly touching the ceiling to the corner of the room by the window, and stopped. He went through the wall, and he seemed to notice I was awake, and gave a sort of oops smile that unsettled me. I felt afraid and debated whether I should wake my fiance or not. But before I could finish deciding, I was so tired I fell back asleep and only truly thought about what happened when I awoke that morning. The entire ordeal only lasted perhaps 10 seconds, but it was one of the strangest things I have ever seen in my life. I have a history of waking up and seeing small bugs for a few seconds, but I have never seen anything so large or vivid since. And I know it couldn't have been a dream, because in my dreams I have no sensation, but I did when this happened. This has honestly been bothering me for a while. Did I see something I wasn't meant to? Or was it a strange mind trick? Has anyone ever had anything similar happen to them? My husband and I were passing by this big glorious white building that resembled Greek and Roman architecture like it was a museum. It was so beautiful and stood out against the landscape that you simply couldn't miss it. So we decided to park and check it out, looking for possible date ideas. The outside had a massive fountain that a bride and groom were taking pictures in front of. Then a robed woman, I'll call her tour guide, approached us and welcomed us to the church. The robe was a little weird for me, but I figured she may have been in a choir. We tried to leave, but the tour guide insisted on giving us a presentation. We really didn't want to listen, but were just being polite. She took us to a room with a giant Jesus statue and everyone in the building except me and my husband and a few others were all dressed in the same robes. That's when I started getting an eerie feeling. After the presentation, the tour guide lady took us into another room where there was a giant globe and many Bibles in different languages. We then had a discussion about spirituality and that we weren't big church people due to our schedules. She mentioned that the followers of this specific church had no issues attending because the church provided them with houses and food and that the followers of the church were all related to the founder. Then the girl had a glow in her face and said, you may have connections to our founder. We were very interested and have our own refined ancestry system to find your long lost relatives. She said that to us and that was enough red flags for me. I took my husband by the hand and said, we need to go now. I started to thank her for her time and we began to leave. And an older woman in a white robe invited us to stay while we were on our way out the door and then insisted that the other girl would have the ancestry test done rather quickly. I told her we had other matters to attend to like a doctor's appointment and then she politely said that we were always open if we had any more questions and handed us reading material. I then pulled out Snapchat due to a notification 
and our tour guide peeked over my shoulder and said, Oh, Snapchat, I haven't seen that in the past 11 months. Come to think of it, I haven't even seen a phone. I got chills of it, and we sped out of the parking lot, never to return. A few years ago, I was about 10 or 11. During one family gathering, my dad and his siblings, my aunt and uncles, talked about their past experience in the old house that they were renting way back when they didn't have kids, me and my cousins. They talked about this ghost kid that was in the house running around and playing and making fun of them once in a while. I can tell you the detailed story about their experiences with the ghost kids, but let's focus on mine. And they kept talking about how the kid also lived in the same old house and perished in it and the kid didn't receive a proper burial. I didn't believe that this ghost kid existed until this experience of mine. Me and my younger sister visited my cousin's house, aka the old house that they rented back then, since we lived in the same neighborhood. This cousin of mine was only four years old. It was only me, my cousin, my younger sister, and my aunt that were in that house. So we hung out and played until lunchtime. My aunt had to go out to buy us food, so me and my sister had to babysit our small cousin for a while. Here's where it gets weird. We were in my little cousin's room. My younger sister was in the bathroom, and I realized we forgot to turn off the TV because I could hear it from my cousin's room. So I went downstairs, turned it off, and went back up. But as I was heading into my cousin's room, I heard him laughing and giggling. So I assumed my sister had finished up with her business and went back into my cousin's room. When we went inside, there was no one else, but my cousin was giggling and facing a corner. So we asked him, Hey buddy, why are you laughing? We were playing, he answered. Who's we? He didn't answer, and he continued to giggle. So I carried him out of the room and we went back downstairs with my little sister and waited for my aunt to get back. I got goosebumps when the realization hit me. Could this have been the infamous ghost child that they were talking about? I used to be a delivery driver, which doesn't sound very interesting because it isn't. I did have to deliver to some very remote places though. One time I delivered to a trailer park just barely inside our designated delivery zone and it was very dark and poorly lit. I'm leaving my car running and keep the headlights and inside lights on to go to deliver the pizza. Upon returning to my car, I sat down in the driver's seat and look up to see a creepy old man standing less than three feet away from my side of the car. He was just staring. It was the equivalent of a jump scare. I just started driving forward, had to do a U-turn to get out of the park and when I turned around, the man was standing in the middle of the road. So I freaked out for a second while I sped around him, only to watch him attempt to chase my car out the trailer park. I put in my two weeks notice after that. Back during the summer of 2017, I was a very stubborn teenager and had no car nor driving license at the time. So my way of going to my friend's house or anywhere in general was that I would always walk to my destination. Occasionally my brother would drop me off at the location I would go to. The city I live in isn't too big and is known for its gangs and drug problems. One afternoon, I put on my earbuds and wanted to get out of the house to meet my friend at a local park, which was an additional 15 minute walk. My neighborhood is a gated community there are two doors to enter and exit from. One leads to the main street and the other leads to an alley behind a middle and elementary school. To make the scenery creepier, the school used to be part of a historical Japanese cemetery. There were rumors about paranormal activity and cult activity happening in the area. My mentality at the time was naive and I brushed off these rumors. Anyone would assume it's gossip. The neighbors would say to get the neighborhood kids to go into their homes early. I take the door that would take me to the main street 
and as soon as I cross at an unmarked crosswalk, I bump into a guy wearing a long red hooded robe. No, not the ones people used after taking showers or for a cover up. It was a legit stereotypical cult robe. I made eye contact with the guy for just a second and noticed his eyes were pitch black. He had no visible pupil. My first thoughts were, damn, this guy must be high on meth. Even in the city center, everyone is always on drugs and it's pretty easy to identify what a person's on. But in his case, it was the contrary. On his lower left eye, he had a tattoo with a pentagram symbol. He looked like he was 25 and really tall, at least 6'1". Through my loud music, I could hear his heavy breathing and it sounded very abnormal, like some sort of strange growl. A sensation I had never heard nor experienced before. About a week had passed and I had completely forgotten about the creepy encounter, the one I had with said guy. My friend calls me one Friday afternoon and tells me to go to hang out at her house to smoke ourselves stupid and enjoy a six pack. As my usual routine goes, I put on my earbuds and walk to the destination, which is nothing out of the ordinary. I get to my friend's house, we have our sesh, get together, and after a few hours of drinking and getting high, I decide to call it a night, not being wary of the time. I realized how late it was and left her house in a hurry, roughly 11.30 p.m. I had my earbuds on as always, and I get to the beginning of the back street slash alley, which is the second entrance to my neighborhood. As soon as I passed the end of elementary school, I had a bad, unsettling feeling that I was being watched. I felt like a deer trapped, knowing that there's a predator around. I always carry a sort of weapon due to terrifying predicaments I've been involved in in the past. It's on the right side of my waist, and I have it ready in case anything fishy is about to go down. This weapon in particular was a pocket knife, and anyone who's ever owned one knows it makes a particular clicking sound. As I got closer to the parked cars, I stopped in the middle of the road where the last street light was lighting. I looked ahead between the cars and the second entrance, and there was a guy in a black robe crouched behind a truck. I kept walking in the middle of the road just because I'd have enough time to make a run for it. This strange guy emerges from the truck breathing heavily, and it reminded me of the encounter I had last week. He walks up close to me and we make eye contact again. This is when I notice it's the same guy. I easily identified him because of his under eye tattoo. He stood there staring at me like I had just ruined something for him. He saw what was in my hand. He stares at it for a few seconds and then begins walking away breathing heavier than before. It almost sounded animalistic. I started to power walk to the entrance. In utter horror, I turn around to see another man emerging from behind another vehicle. I close the door behind me and quickly hide by the closest yard, as each yard has a brick wall separating each house. I stay there for a minute trying to process what the hell I just encountered, get on the phone and was about to call my friend in a panic, when I suddenly heard a conversation going on behind the wall I was hiding. The man went, why didn't you just go for it? It was an easy target. A different voice speaks up. She had a knife. It was going to end up messy. After that, I ran home, petrified. When I arrive home, my dad noticed I was frantic. I tell my dad that nothing's up and that I had seen a possum creep up on me. That's why I was scared. He believed that and I haven't told any of my family what really occurred. It just gives me chills. Till this day, the thought of not carrying my small weapon terrifies me. God only knows what the hell those cult members were really planning on doing that night. I personally believe they were planning on trapping an innocent person to do some sinister, creepy activities. I was in the Marines from 2008 to 2012. I served as an infantry Marine and was stationed in 29 Palms, California. In 2009, while training for my first deployment, we went to a special school called MCC WMWS, Marine Corps Cold Weather Mountain Warfare School, which was located in Bridgeport, California. I enjoyed the five-ish hour bus ride up Highway 395 through the Sierra Nevada mountains. I took in the beautiful scenery 
as my mind wondered about what I was in for, dreading climbing the 12,000 foot plus mountains that littered the landscape. Weeks of training go by. I was relieved to hear that we were moving to a place called Hawthorne to do some live fire exercises, which was about 30 miles away to the east back into the desert. An old out of commission army base that was deemed uninhabitable in the 50s for various reasons. I was enthusiastic to escape the bitterly cold temperatures up the mountain, and I slept on the ride there. Upon waking up, I looked out the window and was shocked at what I saw. Remnants of the old base scattered the landscape, half destroyed buildings, guard towers and other typical military stuff you'd expect to see. Behind that lied a jagged lava rock mountain, casting their shadows over the destroyed buildings. The place looked like a nuclear bomb had gone off nearby. Have you ever seen the old nuclear test video from when it was first developed? They would stage a fake town to analyze what the blast would do. This place was like that, mixed with the game series Fallout and Chernobyl. As we drove in further, I noticed a bunch of mine shafts heading into the side of the mountain. Now I was very curious as to where we would be staying at, and I was relieved to hear there was a makeshift FOB, nothing fancy by any means, just an old green tent for the NCOs and upper ranking battalion staff. Us boots would be sleeping under the stars in the dirt. At least we had a makeshift HESCO wall around us to make things feel a little bit more like home. During chow that evening, we were all sitting around just chatting. And I asked my sergeant what all the mine shafts in the hillsides were for. He said that they were munition storage facilities as well as fallout shelters. The base was designed and built in the Cold War era, which made it super creepy. It's like all the people just decided one day to leave. Vehicles were still there and everything. It was really strange. Night arrives. It was fairly hot out even though it was night, as we were back down in the desert. I was having problems sleeping even though I was just in my skivvies on top of my sleeping bag. Some of the others were awake, chatting, and then I stared into the stars and mountains looming over me. It was a full moon that night with hardly any clouds. As I was scanning the mountain tops, which I had to guess were five to 700 feet above me, from where we were sleeping, it made it seem like I could almost reach out and touch the top. I saw something strange moving about at the peak, figuring my eyes were playing tricks on me. From extreme physical exhaustion and sleep deprivation, I disregarded it. Even later that night, I awoke to take a leak. As I'm utilizing the head, I look up to where I saw something earlier, and to my surprise, the strange silhouetted figures were there scurrying about the ridge line. Now this had definitely caught my interest as my mind was wandering. Thankfully, I had a lot of really cool stuff lying in my backpack at the Biovac site. Once at my gear, I grabbed my trusty PVS night vision monocular. I bring them to my eye and look back up. Nothing. That can't be right. Like, huh? I swear I saw something. I look over to my buddy that was still awake and asked, Hey, did you see something up there? He looked at me like, what the hell are you talking about? I told him to forget about it. A few hours go by and through the night, a loud crash comes from the closest mine shaft, which is located about a hundred feet or so from the FOB. Literally half of the platoon sat up straight from a dead sleep. One of the sergeants screams from a nearby tent and says to hit the rack. It was just some rocks falling which made sense for most of us. The next morning we woke up and did what we had planned to do for the day. Later that afternoon, we had some free time and were creeping around checking the nearby buildings out. Four of us decided to go down into a building. It was half above ground and half below. The wide staircase went down to an open large cubicle type area. Barely any light came through the small windows. I clicked my weapon light and scanned the area. There were still papers and everything strewn about on top of desks. We followed the hallway, which made a turn. MOPP suits and gas masks lined the hallway, 
hanging on hooks. We see a sign above one of the doorways that said, Girls' Locker Room. Us, being the typical 19-year-old Marines that we were, decided to check that out. I took point and entered the pitch-dark room. I was looking through the lockers, trying to find anything interesting, when all of a sudden, the doors behind us slammed shut, and we all ran the hell out of there. Two doors on either side of the room, with lockers lining the sides. That's my life story. The house which my parents bought and built had an already established building on it, right up to the back of the one acre property. It was a barn style shed with a room up top. You know, two lower side sections and a high mid section. Anyway, since then we renovated it and it's now three times bigger. The reason this property was for sale was the owner had passed away. In this case, inside the shed, working on his car via failing jack. I also enjoy working on my own car and regularly maintain it myself. So you'll often find me weekends or late nights tinkering around on one car or another. This one particular night, I was playing around with my wiring, figuring out some electrical issues and doing a service. All was well and it was around 11.30 PM with everything shut, unless you're upstairs. I had been up there earlier, as I had some tools and other stuff stashed out of the way, but I hadn't gone into the room, only the top of the stairs, where there's a small area before the walled off room. But every time I'm up there, I checked the door is closed. So back to working on the car, radio is on a low volume and I had pushed a bunch of wiring serviced and rotated my wheels. Idiot me still had the front jacked up from rotating wheels and checking bearings without stands. Yes, I know it's stupid. I wasn't going to go under and made sure my limbs and fingers were out the way if anything dropped. I also have a habit of putting the wheel underneath the chassis for a fail safe. I figured I'd scoot under it and pull some wiring out from the rear of the body. The car wasn't going anywhere and the front wheels are barely off the ground as it's at four by four with five inch lift. So chances of six studs snapping and a car dropping from that is next to nothing. That's when my encounter begins. Once I'm underneath the car in the renovated area, I get this chill like one of those, I got a bad feeling about this kind of chill. And that's when I hear these thunderous steps sprinting from the far end of the upstairs rooms through the shut door down the flight of stairs in four steps, and suddenly the jack drops. Needless to say, I crapped the bed, froze like I was stuck in this particular snapshot of space and time. My butt puckered so much, it began to prolapse. I didn't know what to do or where to go, but I sure as hell knew it was not a sheer coincidence. I sat there for 45 minutes, just staring at those stairs, like if I took my eyes off them for any second, I would be consumed by whatever was up there. Of course, unable to get any assistance as my partner was in the house and the sheds insulated enough that it doesn't get service unless the doors are open. Fortunately, she came looking for me and asked when I was coming home. I heard her coming, yet I was still staring at the stairs. After what seemed like an eternity, she opened the doors and sees me frozen in time, white as a sheet, staring at stairs when she instantly notices something off, so stays at the door. I finally move and check the jack. Handles unwound completely. A failing ram does not unwind the handle. At this point I explain what happened, and we note the hell out of the shed for the night. On the way I check the window from outside. It was 100% closed. I don't know if this was a coincidence, or the old maid trying to teach me a lesson or something, or perhaps just wanting me to join him. But I can confirm it is as close as I've been to crapping myself since I was a baby. I haven't had any other strange encounters up there luckily, but I'm sure my days are numbered. One night, I had a delivery to a pretty rural area. A lot of my deliveries are to rural areas, so no big deal. But tonight is drizzling and especially dark. 
so I'm having trouble finding the address of the house I'm looking for. So I roll down the passenger window to use my really bright flashlight, pointing it at mailboxes, trees and posts and anything that anyone might have their address on at the end of their driveway. And driving along at five miles an hour, pointing my flashlight, when the beam catches a guy wearing a dark hoodie at the end of an obviously long gravel road staring directly at me. More of a glare really, but whatever. He could just be on his phone or something. Anyway, it gets weirder. I finally find the address I'm looking for and pull up into the drive and hop out the car. That's when I get the sinking feeling. No cars, no house lights, boarded up windows. If you've ever been a delivery person, you know that this is the time to get the hell out of there because you are about to be robbed. Right as I'm about to jump in and throw the car in reverse and note the hell out of there, I see a man walking across the empty field adjacent to the property towards me. Crap. Now I'm a pretty burly bearded dude, so I don't worry a whole lot on deliveries, but this scared the hell out of me. When he gets closer, I see him very obviously tucking something into his waistband. What I can only assume was a firearm. He then says in a thick, menacing Southern accent, I thought you was the law. I guess because of how I was scanning the addresses. I meekly point my car topper and the pizza in my hand and he says in the nicest voice you've ever heard, Oh great, thank you so much. Have a great night pays me, and proceeds to walk back through the open field in the direction of no buildings in the rain with his pizza. For the rest of my shift, I couldn't stop whispering, what the hell? It was the strangest thing that's ever happened to me. I was about six to seven years old. I didn't have any friends when I was that age, because of how messed up my family was, and having ADHD and really messed up teeth. They're fine now after braces and a palate extender, but there was this older girl named Angela next door. She was about 14, and I didn't know any better. And when she asked to hang out all the time, I did. One day she invited me to play or something or whatever, and she brought me into her parents' room. Her dad was an army ranger, but there was a disgusting amount of weapons in that room. She picked up a shotgun and joked about ending me and other people. Me being six or seven just laughed it off thinking it was cool. She then loaded the gun in front of me and showed me how it worked, pointed at my face and told me to crawl around the house for hours. I crawled around and cried and she would put the thing in my mouth and my face and would spook me with many other weapons and dry fire them at me. She then told me at one point to get undressed and I told her I would do it in the bathroom because I was uncomfortable doing it in front of others. So I crawled into the bathroom, slammed the door and locked it, jumped out the window and was about a story and a half up. I landed on my face and chipped my tooth. I got away and kept the secret for about two weeks from my mum. I didn't know any better. When I finally told her she lost it, she called the cops and they went over to her parents and questioned her and her parents. Her reasoning was, is that I shot her with a Nerf gun one time so it was payback. I didn't see her for years later until I found out she was admitted to a mental hospital by her parents. I don't know how that day could have gone, but I'm glad I'm still around. When I was in Vilsack, Germany, the Rose Barracks, as part of the 1st Infantry Division, I had an interesting run. This was about the year 2001, and not so long after a long deployment in Kosovo. I was an E4 about to be promoted to sergeant and had a fellow NCO who named his Humvee Area 51. He told me he had been stationed there for a while as part of a security team made up of army and air force. He told me lots of bizarre stories about the things he saw and the rumors. He then introduced me to a website called the Black Vault. 
The website is still around, but far less conspiracy driven these days. And it contained a lot of conspiracy theory stuff, Freedom of Information Act material about various UFO projects like the Blue Book project. With hindsight, it was probably a bad idea to look at this stuff on a government computer at work. He and I both had a series of encounters with military intelligence and even an actual CIA spook over the next year. They went through my living quarters while I was at work, trailed us, and a year later, I PSC'd, relocated to the National Guard in Texas, and it all ended. But it was a strange amount of attention to receive about a subject that's nonsense to our government. I work at a movie theater in Michigan, and recently we hired a new facilities manager, which is fancy wording for a maintenance man. He's an older guy in his 50s with long white hair and always has a weird look in his eye. He's called Alex. When he first started working here, he talked to me and one of my managers who I'm pretty close with. He was very interested in making movies. My manager and I hope to make movies one day too, so this conversation didn't seem too weird, until it did. Every day he would try and find me or my manager to talk our ears off for long periods of time about how he has made big sounds for Hollywood movies and how he has so many connections. Eventually he began telling us that he has a studio at his house and he would try and get us over separately. He added both of us on Facebook as well and went by the name Alex Crowley. If you don't know who he is, he's a satanic cult leader. I think he was the first one in the UK. He did some very dubious things in the 1940s. After stalking his page, he follows weird neo-fascist pages and is really into devil worship. So his name is very fitting. Once he added us on Facebook, he would constantly send us message after message. Some of them were audio messages of what sounded like Latin or someone speaking backwards. I never replied to these. He would soon confront us for not responding to these messages. While he would send these, he would like and comment on my Facebook posts, even from some years ago. While he was confronting us, the conversation would come back up about going to his house. He had access to our work schedules. He knew when our days off were. And he would say, so I see you have Wednesday off this week. What are you doing? You should come over to my studio. This happened every day. If I didn't see him up to that day off, the next time I worked, he would say, so you had that day off yesterday, why don't you come over? He did the same thing to my manager, who's 24. He even told him to bring a swimsuit and asked what kind of beer he liked to drink. A few weeks go by, he's still pursuing us, but now he's added two more of my co-workers to his creep list. After the same stuff with them, one day my manager and I were working together. And he comes up saying that he put a picture of the A24 logo on his Facebook. Alex put it there because he is supposedly making a sequel to the movie It Follows 2014 with them. He started saying how I needed to go to Detroit with him to be in the movie. And my manager would be the editor of it. The next day after he must have realized Google exists and tried to go back on what he said. Alex told us how the director was fired from A24, when AWOL deleted his Facebook and Twitter and only reached out to Alex because there was no one else he wanted to talk to. He told us this director would be blacklisted from Hollywood as his last movie flopped. Apparently, when your movie is bad, you're never allowed to work in the industry again. At this point, both me and my manager are exhausted from dealing with him and can't stand working with him. I asked one of my fellow co-workers, who I knew he was talking to, if he ever weirded him out. He said, of course. Alex wants to go out with this 18-year-old co-worker fencing, since that was a sport my co-worker was into. Luckily, his mum was Alex's boss, and he told her the very next day he was fired. You know, he could have just been a deranged individual, but something creepy and sinister that's too hard to eloquently put into words was going on there. I'm sure of it. So to the strange satanic maintenance man, let's never meet again.
whatever your intentions were. In high school, one of my best friends was a girl called Susan. She lived with her mum and stepdad out in the middle of nowhere. Even though we were the same age, her parents treated her a lot differently than my parents treated me. For one thing, I was expected to go to driver's training and get a license and a job. I saved enough money working at a fast food job that my parents let me buy a used car. Nothing fancy. I was expected to pay all expenses for it. Susan's parents felt I was a bad influence on her because of my job and my car. Susan wasn't allowed to take driver's training or get a job. After we graduated high school, I joined the military and lost touch with Susan. In the early 90s, living on my own, my parents called me one day at work and passed along a message that Susan had called and wanted to see me. I was really excited to see her. I loved her like a sister. She said she was staying with her mum and stepdad and asked if I remembered where they lived. Of course, I told her. We made arrangements for me to pick her up one night as she still didn't have a driver's license and we'd go to dinner and catch up. The night of our get together, I drove to her childhood home. I went to the back door of a screened in porch and I couldn't help but be a little disturbed and puzzled at what I saw. Stuck to the ceiling were the covers of dozens of paperback books. The books hung down from their covers on the ceiling all over the room. On one wall facing the door of the porch was a large picture of a half man, half goat. It held something in its hand. I don't remember what. There were about 10 bowls with candles in them on the floor and on the tables. I was taking in all of this when I heard Susan say, Jane, come round here. We don't use that room anymore except for special purposes. I went around to the front door and she let me in. There were three chairs set up facing the door and three people were sitting in the chairs. I recognized her mother as one of the people. Her stepfather wearing nothing but an open bathrobe was leaning to one side and drooling. There was another woman seated that I didn't recognize. No one introduced me to her. I smiled and simply said hi to them all. Susan stood off to the side of the half circle of seated people. None of the people responded to my greeting. They all just stared unsmiling. No one said anything. They seemed to be evaluating me. That's when I got frightened. I thought to myself, are these people going to try and end me? And out here, no one would hear me make a sound. I turned to Susan and say, uh, you ready to go? She was ready and we left without incident. We had a nice dinner and a nice visit. I asked her about the room and what it all meant, but she said she didn't want to talk about that. After dinner, I drove her home and didn't get out the car. I couldn't get away fast enough. At work the next day, I was told I had a call from Susan, but it was her mother looking for her. I told her I didn't know where she was, and soon after, and unrelated to this, I moved into a different apartment in a nearby town and got a different job. I never saw Susan again. She reached out to me again on some reunion website, but I never responded. I don't know if they were into devil worshipping or something else, but it really frightened me. For a few weeks after that, strange things happened. I would get phone calls where no one would say anything. I was driving along one day and a tire flew off a car in the oncoming lane and crashed into the windshield of the car behind me. They weren't injured, but I wonder if it was all connected to the strange happenings of that house. The first job I had was at a pizza place in my hometown. It's a really small town with a little over 1000 people. We were right next to a main highway that's about 30 minutes away from a major city. One night around September to October, I'm working with two other co-workers and our manager. The whole shift had been pretty slow and we were getting ready to close at 9 p.m. Around 8.30, two men and a little girl of around eight come in and I go up to the front and ask them if they need help with anything or if they're going to place an order. 
a shorter one of the two men says that they are just passing through. He then asks about the prices of the different items on the menu, and he also asks at which time we close. I answer, and he just says okay, and walks away to sit down with a little girl at a booth. The taller man then leaves the building, and gets into the car parked out front. The smaller man gets up about five minutes, whispers something to the little girl, then leaves. My co-worker and I are watching all of this go down, and talking about how strange it is. The little girl gets up, and starts dancing around to the radio station we have playing. After a few minutes of this, I walk up to her, and ask her if she's hungry, or if she wants a drink. She says she only wants a water, which I get for her, and she takes it back down to the booth and sits down. I ask her who she was waiting on, and she says her dad. My co-worker and I are starting to get worried for her, because the two men haven't returned yet, and it's 8.50. We start to think that neither of them are her father at all. My manager decides to call the police. Our town is too small to have our own police station, so we have to wait for them to come from the next town over, which takes roughly 15 minutes. I go sit with her at the booth, and am making small talk with her, trying to make sure she's safe and nothing happens before the cops arrive. In the middle of our conversation, she gets up and says she has to leave. My manager and I are telling her she needs to stay in the restaurant until her dad comes back, but she starts crying and screaming and insists on leaving. A few days later, my manager says the cops found her walking down the road alone late that night. We never heard any more information about that situation afterwards. I just hope she's safe now wherever she is. When I was two, my parents and I lived in a house that my grandparents owned. Although only two, they apparently could speak quite a bit, as well as a few sentences. My parents' bedroom was connected to mine through the closet, meaning you could walk into their closet, go through a door in the back, and end up in the back of my closet. Then, one day, my mum started having these terrible nightmares. In her dreams, she would wake up surrounded by fire. She'd rush through the closet to my room, scoop me up, and dive out the window. Suddenly, it would flash forward, and her and my dad would be sitting in a waiting room at a hospital. A doctor would come in, look somber, and say, I'm sorry, but... And then she'd wake up at that point, sweating profusely, and her heart racing. One night she woke up to me screaming. She ran into my room and pulled me into her arms, calming me down, and asking me what was wrong. My response was, Mummy, Mummy, my room was on fire. I was on fire. Of course, this freaked her the hell out and I'm willing to admit that me having some sort of similar nightmare may have been caused by me overhearing a conversation about my mum's nightmares. But that's not the freaky part. Not long after this, we moved out. Though not because of the nightmares my mum was having. We lived in southern Illinois at the time, and my parents were having a hard time making enough money to support us living there. So we moved up to northern Illinois. My grandparents sold the house once we moved. About six months after we moved out, my mum was talking to my grandma on the phone. My grandma started telling my mum about how the house we used to live in had caught fire. No one was home at the time, but the bedroom that had been mine had been completely destroyed. The fire had started because of an electrical short in the closet, the one I spoke of before. Every time I share this story, it gives me chills. I am a corporal in the army cadets. Once we were out on field craft, which is a combat exercise down in Yorkshire. I'm Scottish, by the way. During our two week annual camp, we were in a harbour area, which is basically our camp for the duration of the exercise. 
and then we'd go back on base after the three-day exercise. It was around 10 p.m. We were waiting to receive contact from the adult instructors. I was on stag with my mate called Tom, and we were sitting talking while observing the forest around us, and we got contact so we returned fire with blanks, and throughout the chaos of the engagement I saw a white figure near some of the trees. It was around six foot tall, and at the time I put it in the back of my mind until the engagement was over. I asked Tom if he had seen it, and his face went white. He thought he was just seeing things. We then asked the other guys in our section, and they said that they'd seen it too. The next day of the exercise, nothing happened, and I still have no idea what that was. I was raised to believe that ghosts aren't real. I have also never encountered anything I couldn't explain. Until now. I live with my husband and a child in a house made in 1995. We didn't know the history of anyone dying or there being any problems with the house, and we'd lived there three years. During that time, lots of small things have happened. We've always laughed them off or joked about them until last night. For example, some of the smaller things include being home alone during the day. The house shook a little every now and then. Photos hanging up in the kids' playroom would fall, but there'd be no reported earthquakes, flashbangs, or construction sites near us. This one time it was 7 a.m. I called my husband who'd just left for work. I felt the walls for warm pipes, checked the gas for water leaks and nothing. When I turned on the lights, I heard some large scamper. We don't own any pets. We do not have rats. And we have had the house inspected to make sure. Other things happen, like objects end up in places where they weren't before, especially this old cat puppet my husband's aunt found at an auction, which is creepy as it sounds, but my kids love it. All of these things alone have happened in the last six months of living here. Each individual thing has not caused a concern until last night at 5 a.m. when I got up to pee. I came back to bed, turned on my side to face my husband's back, and at that moment I felt something slide and push on my back. A heavy large thing, but it didn't feel like a person. It felt like if you took a heavy pillow and pushed it hard against someone. There was no warmth, no bones, no skin. At this point I'm wide awake but can't move, completely against my own choice. I want to scream and wake my husband, but I can't. I know this isn't sleep paralysis because I literally just woke up to pee. Also, when I felt this thing on my back, my ears pop like a huge amount of pressure. We don't live in a high or low point where that happens, and I don't have a cold. So I'm stuck with this pressure against my back, trying to focus on hands to get them to move to shake my husband. It feels like forever when in reality it's been about five minutes. Then my ears pop again. My head hurts incredibly and I can move and I sit up straight. My husband turns over and asks what's wrong because I've started to cry and I never cry. I start to explain that it's stupid and he wouldn't even believe me. He then asked why I was playing with his neck and his hair and I told him that was impossible because of just what happened. He explained that he felt a warm thing playing with his neck hair for at least the last five minutes. We turn on the light and his neck is red and warm. My headache dissipates after a few minutes. I don't believe in ghosts, but I'm just desperate for someone to tell me I'm not crazy, and that they've experienced something like this. This happened to me when it was my 19th birthday. My friends make me a party in the west part of the city, in a private place called Gran Jardín. This is in Mexico, by the way. It's a really expensive place where a lot of the people that are rich in that area live. The party ends at around 3.10 in the morning. I was leaving, and before I get into my car, I found a few things. There was a scarf on the front door, and weird stuff appeared on the front of my car. A handprint, but it wasn't normal, it was really large. It didn't even look human. After that, I get into the car and leave. 
When I was roughly seven minutes from my house, I was passing the community cemetery, just like any other day, except that my car stopped in front and it just switched off. It completely stopped. It was dead. It was a Honda Civic, I think. And it could be the motor, the battery, but I really wasn't sure. I get out the car, open the door, and was looking around to see what it could be when I start hearing a strange noise coming from the cemetery. That's when I see people, in all black, wearing masks on their faces. I jump right back in my car, close it, and lock it. The people ignore me. I try turning on my car, but it doesn't move. I am absolutely terrified when I saw the door to the cemetery open, and a lot of them make two lines, and I'm really afraid. Are they gonna target me? Imagine you're 19, stuck in front of a cemetery with random people. You're like a deer in the headlights. The men point at me. People start surrounding my car. The tallest of the bunch is in front of it. All the while, I'm desperately twisting my key in the hope that the car turns on. All the people were trying to open the doors, hitting the windows, and I was in tears. It was at that moment that my car miraculously turned on. I put the car in gear and pushed the accelerator. I was expecting to hit someone, but nothing happened. I saw the guy in front, but it was like I went through him. When I looked behind me, in my rear view mirrors, there was no one. I arrived home really scared. I don't really know what to think. I wasn't high, I wasn't drunk. This wasn't a hallucination. Those people were there, and then in a blink they weren't. What the hell was going on that night at the cemetery? My neighbor passed away last week, and since we moved in, We've been friends with him for about 15 years. A few months after he passed away, part of my family visited with their children. Everyone was outside with their kids, when suddenly one of them pointed at the neighbor's property and said, where did the old man go? He was just there. My cousin, the father of the kids, just said that nobody was there and was a little confused and everyone kind of laughed it off. But I think he was, just looking to check if everything was all right with us kind of gave me the creeps a bit, but I hope you rest in peace. Back when I delivered pizzas in my small college town, I used to have to deliver to some pretty remote places. One weekend I was delivering to a house, which was about a mile outside our delivery range. But it was a slow night, and I was saving up tips for a trip in the summer, so I told my boss I would do it. The house was near impossible to find. It was deep in the woods, dark outside, and the driveway was completely overgrown. There was very little cell service too, so my GPS wasn't functioning properly. I passed it four times before seeing a very hidden mailbox, which indicated the house. I got out of my car and went to the front door, knocked a few times, but there was no answer. It didn't look like there were any lights on in the house, but the window blinds were drawn, so it was hard to tell. I could clearly hear what sounded like someone running up and down the stairs over and over. I thought it might be a dog at first, but there was no barking. After about a few minutes of this, I began to feel something was off and became extremely aware of how dark it was, how quiet it was, and how remote I was right now. I determined this dude's crappy trip wasn't worth the agitation and decided to head back. I went back to my car, screamed and dropped the pizzas. There was a kid, probably 11 to 12, sitting on the hood of my car. I have no earthly idea where he came from. He had on a light gray hoodie which combined with the darkness gave him the look of a specter. I picked up the pizzas and gathered myself, and yelled out asking if he lived here and ordered the pizzas. The kid immediately jumped off the hood of my car and sprinted into the woods away from the house. 
I got in the car ready to note the hell out of there. When I reversed out the driveway right before I pulled to the street, I saw a kid emerge from the woods, again, standing on the driveway, watching me leave. I got back to the store and told my boss what happened. He was angry, I didn't make more of an attempt to deliver the pizza. But I talked him into calling the house to confirm the order. No one picked up after four attempts. My boss stopped accepting calls outside our delivery zone after that, more so out of not wasting his driver's time than our safety, as this dude was an ass. We never got a call from that house again for the two remaining months that I worked there. My family decided we would go on an organized ghost hunt at the neighborhood town. It was late at night and there were three sections to this. The first involved using a Ouija board type thing with a glass. Nothing happened. The second involved trying to reach out to spirits in a dark room. Nothing happened. The experiences come from the third section, which was a very old courthouse and we used technology. Firstly, there was digital thermometers set up and one of our family members was sat below one. These thermometers flashed when temperatures spontaneously dropped from room temperature, supposedly a sign of a ghost. All of a sudden, this family member jumped up sort of spooked and moved seats while the organizers were explaining this to us and what we were going to do. He proclaimed he suddenly felt extremely cold and tingly. Lo and behold, the thermometer was also flashing and showing very low temperatures just right where he was sitting. That was odd enough, but the second experience was just as odd. I was in a room by myself with my uncle. I had an EMF meter that lit up in the presence of an electromagnetic field. I do know these devices work. However, I don't know how legitimate the specific one I was holding was. I have my own one at home and it does react to real electrical sources such as my PC and the plug sockets. The other device I had was called a spirit box, which was supposed to detect words ghosts were trying to say to reach out to them. This device didn't convince me at all, and I'm still not fully convinced by it, but certainly more curious about it. I was asking questions, and the EMF meter was flashing in accordance to these questions. It seemed to work, but there was no telling whether it was legitimate or not. However, I wanted to push the boundaries of yes and no questions to see how realistic it all was. If a ghost was real, surely it can answer any binary questions as long as I give it two options and the corresponding amount of flashes on the EMF meter for an answer, not just yes or no. So I did. I asked out loud, are you a man or woman? Flash once for man, twice for woman. At the time, I wasn't convinced this would work and I was skeptical. However, the EMF flashed twice and within five seconds of that, the spirit box displayed and read out loud the word female. Two completely independent devices simultaneously confirmed the answer I supposedly got. That was a big deal for me. And still to this day, I cannot figure out an explanation for that. And the two devices remained consistent for that entire session. I hope for the existence or something beyond life. And this for me was a glimpse at some actual proof. I got chased by a cult once when I was a teenager running around at 2 a.m. with my friends. But that was near population. And I've run across ritual locations where whatever they summoned wanted an offering from me. Way out in the Sierras. A bit of background. I grew up on a hill that was only about 300 feet tall to the east of the Silicon Valley. I could see the valley looking west and a large lake looking east with no roads or anything all around to Highway 5. A rich dude purchased land for a golf course and country club, which was around a quarter of a mile from my home. It was one of the kinds with tennis courts, golfing, several pools and a hot tub, five yurt type round buildings with different functions, weightlifting aerobics and party spots. There was also an extremely tall building a bit further down past the swimming pool for wedding events and the like. We at a certain point began calling it Motel Hell. 
This was when I was around five, and we went there a lot. At some point, the developer decided to abandon it. The pools turned green and then dried up. We were in our early teenage years at this point, running around toilet papering neighbors, running about in the middle of the night, thinking we were invincible, shooting flare guns, doing things that would get you thrown in jail. Sad to see how things have changed. We had seen the ritual drawings and such in various locations around the place and learnt about some of them from the library. Sometimes we would go to the ex-party place and there would be large drawings on the floors and the walls. We would notice that even if it was 100 degrees outside, it would still be freezing cold to the point you'd nearly see your breath. We knew people were there at night because our bus stop was in the parking lot and we would spend morning breaks with many hundreds of bottles left sitting around by the older teenagers at night. Anyway, we were out running around around 2 a.m. one Friday. We could see lights at the club and decided to sneak up through the golf course from the back because there were some more bushes and trees. We crept up, got an earshot in sight and saw them performing a ritual. After a few minutes of observing them, one suddenly turned in his robes and pointed out into the darkness towards us. Not sure what he said, but they all sprinted out towards us. Not like they could catch us, but they tried for a good hour. Safe to say I tried avoiding that area from there on out. To set the scene, this story is from about five years ago, give or take a few months. I was 19, living in a very large city in the southern US, population nearly 2 million, with several military installations. I was dating a guy who at the time was in the army and stationed on the joint base nearest to where I was living. I had a full-time job and was also in school, but all of my free time was spent with my boyfriend. And since he was in training at the time, he didn't have a car. So I was on and off that base constantly and had gotten to know the gate guard. I still had to present my visitor pass and ID every time because of protocol, but they knew me. The base itself is huge, like its small little town in of itself. Driving onto the base by accident is impossible. There are a few entrances, but I usually used the second biggest one. To get there, you drove down a five lane road with two lanes each way and one turning lane. As you approach, there's a huge golf course that's part of the base, as well as our national cemetery. So huge fences and large signs stating its government property. And to the right, some businesses, restaurants, barbers, dry cleaners, gas station, as well as a few residential neighborhoods with smaller side streets. But as you get closer to the gate, there's really nowhere to go except to the base, unless you're going to the physical rehab center slash senior living center that's on the right. And literally the last place to turn in before you're going through the gates. The road leading into the base is really long. So as you go further away from the base on the same road, there's more businesses, more neighborhoods and more apartments, an HEB and a Walmart both roughly three to five miles, give or take, from this gate. I also happened to use this road when I was going straight from work to pick up my boyfriend, as there's an exit from the interstate and is the most direct route. So I was just heading down the road, and one thing I'll note is that I'm pretty careful as a driver. Since I got into a terrible car accident with my mum when I was 12 and was severely injured, I drive a little faster than the speed limit, but not too much and always try and move out of the way for people going faster than me because I know it can be annoying to be stuck behind someone driving slowly. I was about two miles from the base in the right hand lane when I come up on someone slowing down to take a turn. I checked my mirrors, flicked on my blinkers and went to make a lane change to go around them. There had been an old clunky blue van like a Chevy Astro or something in the left lane, but it was still pretty far back and I was planning to move back to my lane anyway. As soon as I passed the car in front of me, Mr. Astro didn't like me getting into his lane when I was going slower than he was. Again, he was far enough back that if he maintained his speed, I'd have been back over before he even reached me, but no, I heard an engine rev and all of a sudden this dude was right on my bumper, laying on his horn, 
making the typical rude gestures you'd expect. I've always been rather meek and quiet and hate confrontation. So I was going to pull back into the right lane and get back over once I passed the car in front of me. But by then there was another car in that lane trying to speed past everyone. So I couldn't move over immediately. As I waited for the other car to pass by so I could move into the right lane, the Astra behind me is speeding up on my tail and then backing off just to speed up onto my tail again. The other car passes and I move into the right lane so the Astro can pass me. He sped up and then slowed so he was driving right next to my car. I glanced over and this older looking dude with raggedy hair and a dirty ratty looking beard just stared over at me, still making rude gestures and then made a gun sign with his hand and pointed his fingers at me and mimicked shooting me in the head. This really freaked me out, but not as much as when he slowed down even further and got right behind me again. This road could really be trafficy during rush hours, but I'd gotten off work early, around 3.45, so the traffic wasn't bad and he definitely did not need to be behind me anymore. There was so much room for him to just go around and leave behind me. Obviously freaked out, I tried to shake him. I changed lanes, but he followed. I slowed down, so he did. And so I got back into the right lane coming up on a light that had just turned yellow and made a pretty risky, very quick right turn onto that road, hoping he wouldn't be able to follow me. He apparently didn't care and took the turn right after me. I remember looking in my rear view mirror and seeing the van practically leaning on the turn and he was still yelling and making hand gestures. I took some more turns and started weaving through a neighborhood trying to lose him, but he was persistent. Finally, a moment of clarity hit me when I took a sharp turn and my visitor pass for base slid off the front seat. Duh. I wove through the neighborhood until I got back to the road we had been on, the one that leads straight to the base, and I booked it down that road with Mr. Astro right behind me. I saw him in my rear view as I pulled up to the gate and was terrified to see him pull in behind me. I thought there was no way this guy could follow me onto the base. At the time, they were in FPCON Bravo, which means no one could drive on base unless they had proper military staff ID or a 30 day visitor pass plus driving license. Luckily, I knew the guard at the gate. I pulled in and he could tell I was a bit frazzled because my hands were shaking as I handed him my pass and ID. Before he could ask, I said, the guy in the car behind me is really scaring me. He's been following me for 15 minutes and making hand gestures and yelling and he made finger guns like he was gonna shoot me. The guard was super nice, smiled and nodded and acted like everything was okay. Didn't even glance back at the van and he told me, okay, don't you worry about it. You're in safe hands now. The guy won't get anywhere near you. Is your boyfriend done for the day? I said, no, I don't think he's done until 4.30. I was just gonna read in my car until he finishes. He told me to go about with my plans, to head over to my boyfriend's barracks and he and the other guards could handle it. I did exactly what he told me to do. My boyfriend's barracks weren't far back from the gate entrance, luckily, and after two turns, I would be completely out of sight from the gate. I waited for my boyfriend, and when he came out, I told him everything that happened. I was shaking and crying, and he ended up driving us back to my place. We exited from the main gate that was on the other side of the base, it was a longer drive home, but meant that we wouldn't run the risk of the guy possibly waiting on a side road for me to drive back out of the base. When I took him back that night, the guard had obviously done a shift change, but my boyfriend knew the one working and asked if she'd heard anything about a guy following someone. She was very excited to tell us that the dude in the blue van had been arrested by the military police. As it turned out, the dude tried to tell the guard I was his daughter and that I was just being difficult. And could he please let me go through to get me? The guard played it cool and pretended to be understanding, but said he needed to do a sweep of the car and they would have to have someone escort him to find me since he didn't have military ID nor visitor pass. The guy tried to say no, but the guard insisted. The guy tried to lead foot it through the military gate anyway. Clearly not a good idea to try and force your way onto a military installation. 
He didn't even make it a quarter of a mile before the military police had him pull over and cuffed him, and they found a gun in his center console. I don't know what that guy would have done to me had he caught up with me, assaulted, or anything worse. I no longer live in that city, and I'm no longer dating that boyfriend. I have new license plates on my car, and I live in a new state. And I have no idea what eventually happened to Mr. Astro. I'm pretty sure he did some jail time considering he tried to gun it through the base with a firearm in the console, but I have no idea how much time and have no desire to try and find out what happened to him. So yeah, Mr. Astro, let's never meet again. I work at a multi-billion dollar retail chain. And besides my main other department, which is also in the back room, there is a second department I'm cross-trained in, that I work in for a few hours every Saturday, accepting deliveries. Now, I'm of average build, not overweight, but not as slender as I used to be. I have kids, so I have a bit of a mummy tummy that I fought to get rid of for years. I think I look average, but used to get a lot of attention back in the day from young men. Around when I was in my 20s, I'm now in my mid 30s, and thought I looked a little younger. It's not by as much as it used to be. These days, the only guys eyeing me up are 10 years older than me, and usually unattractive too. I'm married, and I'm not looking for a replacement. I love my husband. There's a good variety of delivery drivers who deliver to my store, and I know many of the regulars by name. Every now and then, there's a new driver or a substitute driver for one of the companies. But for the most part, it's the same people. So there's a regular driver who comes in every Saturday to deliver milk. We all call him Mike. He's in his mid-fifties, a nearing retirement age for the company he works for. He's friendly and cheerful, and always greets everyone happily, and loves making jokes. He even does the shave and a haircut two bits, knock on our bay door when he arrives. I've always thought he was pretty cool, and even said he was my favorite delivery driver since he's so nice. I think he may have gotten the wrong idea though. When I first started there, the other lady who used to substitute in that department warned me that Mike was a terrible flirt and that he liked to try and get with all the ladies. I kind of shrugged it off. I didn't think it was a big deal. Over the past year, he said that I'm his favorite receiving person and that I'm beautiful. He has been very flirty and even asked me out on lunch dates and I've always declined and told him I was married. This hasn't deterred him in the least. He could care less about that. Mike has gotten friendly enough to show me pictures and videos of trips he's been on and whatnot. Last week, he showed me a video of the driveway up his house and views around his 300 acres of land. I thought it was rather odd. I mean, why show someone your driveway and or your land? What was his goal? He started calling me a nickname recently, which no one had ever really called me, as it was something only my creeper dad ever called me. Even my husband knows to steer well clear of the nickname as it triggers me. It's an obvious nickname for my name, but no one uses it, kind of like Mike is a name for Michael or Kate for Caitlin. Well, yesterday, just before he left, he said something I wasn't expecting. Mike asked me if he could shrink wrap me and take me home with him. I gave him a firm but immediate no. This immediately made me think of a murder that happened in my area before I moved out here, where a woman was saran wrapped by her boyfriend and dumped naked, wrapped on the side of a highway. The police were never able to connect the guy to the murder, though the locals knew he had to be the one who did it and I was told he left the area after that. The more I think of his question, the more creeped out I get. I wonder if I should report it to management, or just tell him to cut the crap out next time I see him as a warning. My company prefers people to tell harassers to stop before reporting an issue. 
I'm not sure if this falls into that category, or if it's creepy enough to just be something I should report right away. What do you guys think? All I know is I'm really uncomfortable having to see him again next Saturday when he returns. I took my manager aside and told her the situation, and she agreed that it definitely wasn't appropriate, and that she wants a written statement from me on the matter. So we'll see how it's handled. If he stops delivering to my store or stops being creepy, I'll know it's been handled properly. Update. I spoke to my assistant manager on Friday, and she said that it was being handled by ethics, so not at store level. I told her I was thinking of having my supervisor shadow me while the guy was there. Saturday morning came along, and I felt like crap and didn't really want to have to deal with him on top of already feeling tired, so I just called out. Some poor support manager had to deal with him instead. I don't know how long it will take them to address the issue, but I hope it's soon. Update 2. My case is being investigated at store level again. Did the statement and answer questions and whatnot? I won't know anything for a while. Update 3. Today I was anxious and got to work, as I know it's the day the creepy guy delivers milk. The closer it got to 7.30am, the more nervous I became. Just before 7.30am, I went down to my other work area on the opposite side of the back room. It's a huge store, so that was roughly 600 feet away. When I got there, I discovered that my supervisor wasn't there, as I had feared, and my anxiety only grew. When I got back to my area, there were only a few merchandisers milling about, loading up their products onto carts and whatnot. I didn't see any other managers, including the one I had spoken to earlier in the day, to confirm that he would be present and nearby to give me some sense of security. In a moment of desperation, I thought back, to what my co-worker had told me just yesterday, and that was to ask a female co-worker to stay with me and look out for me. So I asked one and she said she would. We waited in the back room, distracting ourselves with meaningless tasks to pass the time. Before I knew it, half an hour went by, and an hour, and then another hour. No milk guy. I went to lunch and thanked my co-worker for humoring me and staying nearby. After lunch, I checked to see if the milk ever came, but it hadn't. I was pretty happy I didn't have to see him for another week at least. Then later, I was pulled into the office at the end of my shift. The manager then told me that as of today, Mike is no longer permitted in our store. He can't deliver there or even stop there, so now they have to rearrange our delivery schedule for milk. But I honestly was just so relieved. I told the manager that I felt very relieved and thanked him for letting me know. It was like a weight had finally been lifted off my chest. So, creepy delivery driver that used to deliver to the store, let's never meet again. I work on a dairy, and just the other night I had to clean the milk barn by myself. No one else was on the property, and as I was cleaning, I kept seeing something out of the corner of my eye. It looked like a little white face about knee height that was just staring at me. I saw the face near the corners of the barn, and when I turned, there was nothing there, as if what I saw had just ducked around the corner. Then when I went out the gate to open the gate to the coral, I heard someone yell at me, even though everyone was gone. I, a 21-year-old man, called home for my dad to come help me finish up and calm down, but my parents were out for the night and no one answered. I finished and went home, and had to sit there by myself until they got back. 